If you've ever gone on a haunted tour of New Orleans, like I have, you are bound to stop at the former residence of one Madame Delphine La Lurie. Uh, cue the spooky haunted house music. Located at 1140 Royal Street, the La Lurie Mansion, as it's now known, is just one short block off the Bourbon Street of New Orleans Mardi Gras, infamy, breasts and beads, alcohol and carpe diem. The La Lurie Mansion is a swanky looking structure in the French Quarter that currently is a private re residence that no one is believed to actually live in. Its emptiness certainly adds to its eeriness. It's had its fair share of owners over the years. No one seems to stay long. Uh, actor Nicolas Cage recently owned and then lost it to the bank during a bankruptcy uh, proceeding. And current uh, anonymous owner bought it at an auction for, for around two and a half million dollars. Uh, back in 2010. I initially wanted to say it's a really creepy looking place, but I think it only appears creepy to me because of what I've heard has happened inside its walls. Some say, like my ghost tour guide, that the La Lurie Mansion is the most haunted place in all of New Orleans, a city known amongst ghost hunters as a land of many, many hauntings. Uh, New Orleans consistently makes or tops various internet lists of the most haunted cities in America. Over the years, there have been numerous supposed paranormal sightings in the La Lurie Mansion, such as one occupant claiming to have been attacked by a naked black man in chains who then ended his mysterious assault by just abruptly vanishing. Others have claimed to have heard the sounds of animals being butchered inside the house. Children have been allegedly attacked by a phantom with a whip. Strange figures wrapped in shrouds have suddenly appeared inside the home. One occupant, a young mother, was once terrified to find a woman in elegant evening clothes bending over her sleeping infant before vanishing into thin air. And there have been all kinds of claims of hearing screams, groans, and cries throughout the night. Our tour guide uh, told my wife, Lindsay, and I that he himself had, had seen apparitions uh, appearing in the windows several different times. I remember standing on Royal Street across from the mansion, goosebumps covering my arms. Our guide also spoke of strange accidental deaths that have happened over the years to those who have dared walk on the sidewalk in front of the house. Are all these tales real or just baseless ghost stories repeated to sell more haunted tour tickets? And why this house? Out of all the creepy homes in New Orleans, there's about a thousand homes that qualify as a great place to film a horror movie. Why this location? We learned on the Axeman Suck of New Orleans months and months ago that plenty of horrific shit has happened in a variety of other New Orleans homes. So again, why is the residence of Madame Delphine Lullerie uh, supposedly haunted? Well, the answer takes us to even darker possibilities than hauntings. Here's an example of what a New Orleans ghost tour guide may tell you about the horrors some volunteer firemen may have encountered when the LaLaurie home caught fire on April 10th, 1834. This is a, a, a guide um, speech referenced in the book Madam, Mad Madam LaLaurie, New Orleans' Most Famous Murderess Revealed. When I read this book, I immediately assumed that the authors Victoria Cosner Love and Lorelai Shannon may have had the same tour guide that I did. Uh, this tour guide's depiction of what the firemen who arrived at Madame Delphine's supposed house of horrors is going to be extremely graphic. The firemen broke down the doors and found a scene more hellish than the inferno on the lower floors. These strong men, used to gore and carnage, backed out of the room shaking and retching. Some could not stop themselves from vomiting. At last, the firemen claimed, calmed themselves. Along with some of Lollary's neighbors, they went into the attic to save the poor, wretched creatures that they had discovered. Everywhere the firemen looked, they saw chained slaves. Some were naked and some nearly dead. The stench of fear, sweat, and human waste was stomach-turning. But what the firemen saw was infinitely worse. All of the slaves had been outrageously mutilated, abused, or starved. One woman had her skin peeled in a spiral around and around her body, so she resembled a macabre caterpillar. One man and one woman appeared to have had crude, a crude sex change operation performed on them. Her breasts were sloppily sewn onto his chest and his penis sewn to her crotch. Another man chained to the wall had a hole drilled into his head. Maggots crawled in and out of an open wound. A woman had all of her bones broken and reset at different angles so that she resembled a nightmarish crab. When the doors burst open, she scuttled to a corner to hide shrieking out a high, hideous, barking sound. Buckets of body parts littered the room. Several of the slaves perished when rescuers tried to move them. Others fainted from the shock. One woman, blind with terror, jumped to her death from the window. What the fuck was going on in the Lollary home? These firemen stumbled across, uh, you know, some evidence of, of maybe the worst treatment of, of slaves or just human beings in general in, in American history which is saying a lot, 
Or is the tale of Madame Delphine Lalaurie, uh, you know, an example of one of the worst cases of slander in American history, as some historians suspect, which would also be saying a lot? Or is the truth, as it often is, somewhere in the middle? We're going to find out today. Today, we dive into the folklore that surrounds the life of Madame Lalaurie, which leads us into an examination of life in New Orleans in the early 19th century and sends us into the world of voodoo, hoodoo, laws regarding the treatment of New Orleans slaves, the War of 1812, and much, much more. While we may never know exactly where the line between fact and fiction is drawn with the tale, the dark tale of Madame LaLaurie, we know for sure that her story is an interesting one, which is why she is our topic of the week today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, suckers. Work can wait. It's time for Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, Lucifino and Bojangles? Yeah, you're cool too. What about Triple M? What about Triple M? Summer's here, and that means so is Yacht Rock. And who's the captain of the Yacht Rock Cock Yacht? Michael motherfucking McDonald, that's who. Shine, sweet freedom, shine your light on me. Bam, bam, bam. You are the magic, you're right where I want to be. Oh, sweet freedom. Carry me along, bum, bum, bum. we'll keep the spirit alive, on and on. Bum, bum, la, na, na. Just gave myself the chills, I was all over the fucking note, the music map on that one. I start, started in the key of uh, F uh, minor, I went into the key of C++, and then I went into the little known uh, key of A slash F squared. Uh, just, you know, just showing off, showing off some skills. That's a tricky one. Man, that's a tricky one, man. That song. If you're feeling sad, by the way, uh, find that YouTube on, uh, or that video on YouTube. Michael McDonald, Billy Crystal, Gregory Hines, So Much Joy, uh, good old Running Scared. Classic soundtrack song, and the video is just great. When the, the video was done back when, the, when, <laughs> when the, like, the singers would be in the video with the stars of the movie. Like They would film it like in locations from the movie. I love that kind of stuff. Sorry about that buzz. That was me hitting something I shouldn't. That was me putting my hand... On a, on a cable where I shouldn't have. But uh, yeah, that's, not, that's a tricky one. It's a tricky one, but it's been, it's been a long time since you got McDonald's and I wanted to try it. Dan Cummins, a master sucker. Third chair guitar for the Triple M backing band. I'm gonna see Michael McDonald uh, this summer. And you know, if something, if he gets sick, maybe, maybe I could fill in. I could work on it. You know, if I can, if I can master this song, I could probably master the others. Sure, sweet, free. That's where I should have started. It's going to be in my head if I don't get it out. Shine, sweet thrill, shine your light on me. Bam, bam, bam. You are the magic, you're right. That's how you're supposed to fucking do it. Wow, I love challenges. Today's story is a challenge, but it's going to be a fun one. Let's make learning fun today. More cool updates at the end of today's show. Uh, they're always cool, but the past few weeks have been extra, extra special sugar on top, cherry on top of the sugar, or whatever, however, however that goes. Quick announcement on behalf of the Time Suck uh, documentary filmmakers, Jamie Jean and Elliot Davis. These two cool cats. These two, these two fine, upstanding gentlemen. Uh, they're, they were making a, a Time Suck documentary. It's been in the works for a while now. You now, these things take time. We have no idea when it'll be done, where or when it'll, it'll be released. 2020, probably the earliest the way these things go. Uh, but it's been an ongoing project for quite some time. And, and Jamie and Elliot are going to be in Seattle this Saturday. They're going to be screening their first feature-length documentary, The Kick-Ass and Heartwarming Wind and Water Balloons. It's going to be May 4th, 4, 10 p.m., part of the Port Orchard Film Festival just outside of Seattle. Wind and Water Balloons is the story of Jamie's hometown of Cordova, Alabama, a town destroyed by not one but two violent tornadoes in 2011. And then this small community fought back, fought together, united itself in uh, one of the most unlikely of ways with the return of a 70-plus year tradition of Halloween night water balloon warfare. Hail Nimrod. Uh, Jamie and Element, uh, Jesus Christ. I don't even know what I said there. Literally don't even know what I said. Jamie and Elliot will be up from Nashville to attend the showing and, uh, and they're going to have a little Q&A and they would love to meet some time suckers. Who knows? If you show up, you, you might get a put in the documentary. They're going to have their cameras. Uh, for more info, go to the portorchardfilmfest.com. Link in today's episode description. Uh, thanks again for the recent iTunes ratings and reviews. They're all appreciated. Uh, help spread the suck, as do ratings and reviews in every possible place you can watch and listen. And yes, you can't watch. The suck is on YouTube uh, in video form. If you like watching a madman ran alone in a room for two hours, you can see my sweet shirt I got today. Steve Gadlin, Star Makers. 
As Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley said, it may be last uh, place as far as the TV Guide rankings, but it's first in our hearts. You space leaders know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, hoping my shows in Dallas and Houston went well, recording this ahead of those shows, which have not happened. Hope my son Kyler enjoyed his first comedy road trip with dad. I hope I didn't have to scream at him for being late, which has been a thing lately. Uh, excited this week for shows at the Punchline in San Francisco, May 1st to the 4th. Saturday first show sold out. Some of the other shows are close. So if you're planning on gumming, uh, what, the, what am I talking about? You're not planning on gumming? What are you going to be gumming? If you're planning on coming, then you should get those tickets so you get the show you want. Uh, live Ant Hill Kids, Time Suck on Saturday the 4th. Uh, looking like it may sell out as well. May 9th to the 11th at Laugh Boston in Boston, Massachusetts. Love Boston. Another live Ant Hill Kids Suck in Spokane, Washington on Sunday, May 19th. Then the Comedy Zone in Jacksonville, Florida, May 30th, 31st, and June 1st. And then I'm off to Omaha, Nebraska, June 7th and 8th. Another good song. Omaha, somewhere in middle America, getting right to the heart of matters. It's the heart that matters more. Did you know that Adam Duritz from the Counting Crows wrote that song before he'd ever set foot in Omaha? That was a fun, random fact I learned uh, watching an Adam Duritz interview. Because I, I like that band. A lot of people don't. But I, I do. Okay? So I fucking, if that, if that means you can't listen to Time Second anymore, because you're like, fuck that guy! I'm not sticking around here. I <laughs> See what I did? I referenced another song. Um, ticket info for the entire 2019 Happy Murder stand-up tours at dancummins.tv. Uh, hope you got your tickets as well to The Gathering. 55 tickets went on sale when this episode began uh, for the first of what is hopefully going to be many annual times at Gatherings. Actually, it's the second. The first just wasn't called The Gathering. Last year, some of us did gather at the brand new Suck, Ju- Suck Dungeon. It was about 25 of us. Now it's going to be 55, hopefully many more next year. And that gathering is going to happen on Saturday, August 17th, 2019. Uh, yeah, and see if, any, if you want to see if any tickets are left, you go to the Time Suck Merch Shopify website. Select The Gathering tab uh, and just... Uh, Hope that there's tickets there. Uh, make sure you read all the directions and include your shirt size and mailing address and preferred tour time of the Suck Dungeon when you sign up. It, it's all there on the site. Uh, also in the site, also in the store, new, new t-shirt. Hits the store today. White one. Got to vary it up. Can't all be black. Uh, check out our all-American fact checker shirt. And, uh, and I know, I know, not all of us time suckers are American, but we're based here in America and it felt good to uh, tip the hat. Tip, what am I? God damn it. Tip the hat. This is going to be a fun episode today. We haven't even got to the French shit. And I'm, I, my batting average on words is about 40 fucking percent right now. Uh, but yeah, I got to tip the hat to the homeland of the suck. Uh, it also felt right to acknowledge Time Sucks' dedication to the truth, which is a group effort, as you guys know. We do our best here to tell you the story of the week to the best of our ability, and then collectively, you glorious listeners, catch mistakes and you correct them. Getting to the truth can be extremely difficult. Uh, finding stuff online, There's a lot of books, not all of them are accurate. A lot of, lot of uh, websites, very few of them are accurate. And we, and we couldn't uh, be accurate consistently uh, or as consistently as we are without you meat sack fact checkers. So hail Nimrod and be gone, Lucifina. This torso topper is made out of 200% theosophical truth crystal, 400% Mount Shasta Lemurian battle armor for enhanced third eye awareness and extra half dimension of astral plane projection. Why can I say things like that correctly? If I gave like a new age speech, I feel like I'd be nailing shit. And then if someone was like, hey, can you give me your address? I live on the street of Idaho Street. I courted in. Happy, what? Um, okay, let's get to some history. Let's get to some horror and, uh, and see what else we get to with today's tale. It is time now for Madame Delphi. We're going we're gonna to go quick in today's timeline. No dicking around. The, uh, the context surrounding Madame Lalaurie's life will come up organically as we chronologically march forward. Voodoo, hoodoo, slavery, war, going to get into all kinds of uh, surrounding, interesting, contextual shit. As we examine the life of someone by, by primarily examining the lives of those around her, since uh, surprisingly little was written about giant chunks of the life of someone who has become so infamous. Let's get to it. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. To talk about Marie Delphine Lalaurie, who we think was born in 1787, it's important to know uh, about the social and political circumstances of Louisiana, uh, previous to when Lalaurie lived there. When Lalaurie was born, New Orleans was uh, still a city in the Louisiana Territory. Let's talk about that territory. Uh, how about you come back to 1682 with me? That year, 
people were way grosser than now because bikini wax and good shampoo and scientifically enhanced skin products hadn't been created yet. No one ever applied sunscreen or used legitimate toothpaste ever. Picture that when you hear about somebody beautiful from back then. Kind of beautiful. Beautiful with fucking brown teeth and leather skin. Also in 1682, Louisiana, the territory, not the American state, was founded by French explorer René Robert uh, Cavalier, Sire de la Salle. Cavalier named it in honor of the French king, Louis XIV. It originally covered an expansive territory that included most of the drainage basin of the Mississippi River, stretched from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Appalachian, nailed it, mountains to the Rocky Mountains. However, just because Cavalier had uh, claimed a great deal of territory in North America didn't necessarily mean that all of it was developed or even inhabited by Europeans. The biggest settlements were New Orleans, founded in 1718, Quebec, founded in 1608, and Montreal, uh, founded in 1642. While the French had forts from Florida to Wisconsin, there just weren't that many Europeans in North America. Two and a half million is the estimated population of North America in 1775. And most of those people were in major metropolitan areas like Philadelphia and New York City. Uh, and it's estimated that around 7,000 European immigrants settled in Louisiana during the 18th century. Not a lot. A number 100 times lower than the number of British colonists on the Atlantic coast. Because of everything being spread out, it was relatively hard to defend territory that you had claimed, especially if you were already fighting wars at home, as Louis XIV was. Fast forward to 1756, the Seven Years' War begins and includes every great power in the Western world, but basically the rundown is that it's England versus France, with Prussia, Portugal, small German states coming in on England's side, France getting a little backup from the Holy Roman Empire, Russia, and Spain. Some historians call this war World War Zero because of its unprecedented, at the time, global scale. So what happened in that little conflict? Well, conflict between uh, Great Britain and France broke out in 1754. Uh, you know, last between 1754 and 1756, when the British attacked disputed French positions in North America, starting with the British ambush of a small French force at the Battle of Jumonville, Jumonville Glen, on May 28, 1754, and extended across the colonial boundaries and the seizure of uh, hundreds of French merchant ships at sea. A lot of stuff also happens on mainland Europe, focuses on Prussia trying to recover some land from Austria, which we won't get into. But you can imagine it was a sort of a mini version of the chain of alliances that set off World War I which we've uh, talked about here on The Suck, with everyone jumping to the side of either England or France, depending on where their enemies were. This war is also called the French and Indian War, which specifically refers to the conflict between France and England in the New World. So what happened in the New World? In the early uh, 1750s, France's expansion into the Ohio River Valley repeatedly brought it into conflict with the claims of the British colonies, especially Virginia. During 1754 and 1755, the French defeated in quick succession the young George Washington, General Edward Braddock, and Braddock's successor, Governor William Shirley of Massachusetts. In 1755, Governor Shirley, fearing that the French settlers in Nova Scotia, a.k.a. Acadia, would side with France in any military confrontation, uh, he expelled hundreds of the Acadians uh, to other uh, British colonies. Many of these exiles suffered cruelly. We'll talk about these exiles, or at least their descendants here in a little bit. Uh, throughout this period, the British military effort was hampered by lack of interest at home, rivalries among the American colonies, and France's greater success in winning the support of the American uh, Indians. In 1756, uh, the British formally declared war, making the official beginning of the Seven Years' uh, War. But their new commander in America, Lord uh, Loudon, a.k.a. John Campbell IV, uh, Earl of Loudon, faced the same problems as his predecessors and met with little success against the French and their native allies. What a pompous name, by the way. Lord Loudon. It is I, Lord Loudon. Stare upon my white powdered wig. Behold my shiny buckled shoes. Gaze in awe upon my cotton knicker socks. Lord Loudon wears nothing but the fanciest of fancy tall socks. Uh, the tide turned in 1757 because William Pitt, the new British leader, saw the colonial conflicts as the key to building a vast British empire. Burrowing heavily to finance the war, or burrowing, he fucking just burrowed himself in the ground. He's like, I, I gotta pay for this war somehow. It's quick, let's dig a hole. I gotta bur do some burrowing. He borrowed <laughs> heavily to finance the war. He paid Prussia to fight in Europe, and he reimbursed the colonies for raising troops in North America. In July 1758, the British won their first great victory at uh, Louisbourg, near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. A month later, they took Fort uh, Frontenac at the western end of the river. Then they closed in on Quebec, where G General James Wolfe won a spectacular victory on the Plains of Abraham in September 1759. 
where both he and the French commander, the Marquis uh, de Montcalm, were fatally wounded. With the fall of Montreal in September 1760, the French lost their last foothold in Canada. England redirects its energy to taking as much of Spain's and France's territories across the world as it can. Finally, it's time for some peace conferences. In 1763, France, England, and Spain planning on sitting down and figuring out how to divide up the new world. England has the 13 colonies on the East Coast and parts of Canada. France has parts of Canada and Louisiana. Spain has Florida and Cuba. So here's what France does. Because they hate England so much, as negotiations begin to end the Seven Years' War, Louis XIV secretly proposes to his cousin Charles III of Spain that France give Louisiana to Spain in the Treaty of Fontainebleau. When the treaty actually gets drawn up, it's called the Treaty of Paris. It ends the war with a provision in which France cedes all territory east of the Mississippi, including Canada, to Britain. Spain cedes Florida and land east of the Mississippi, including Baton Rouge, to Britain. Spain now controls Louisiana, and New Orleans becomes a Spanish city. We touched on some of this in the Napoleon suck. Also at this time, England starts kicking out French Canadians from Canada. This sets off the Acadian Cajun migration uh, with French settlers from Quebec and settlers on the east side of the Mississippi who had been ordered to leave the new Indian reserve migrating to, to Louisiana, which they believed was still French controlled land west of the Mississippi as well as New Orleans. Then in 1768, Antonio de, uh, de Alua becomes the first, I probably fucked up his last name, uh, becomes the first Spanish governor of Louisiana. Doesn't go well. He doesn't even get to fly the Spanish flag and is forced to leave by a pro-French mob in the rebellion of 1768. The next year, uh, Alejandro O'Reilly suppresses the rebellion, executes its leaders, and sends some plotters to prison in Morro Castle in Havana, Cuba. Things go a lot better for Alejandro. A uh, few executions, you know, sometimes it's a good way to establish some law and order. Uh, you know, send enough fear into the hearts of the citizens to properly rule them. Totally works. Just ask Lenin or almost every other dictator in history. Uh, Alejandro was uh, otherwise benign and, and pardons other participants who swore allegiance to Spain. He established Spanish law and the Council of New Orleans. And he also has an interesting name, this guy. Or, or maybe it just sounds interesting to me or funny to me because of that stupid O'Reilly auto parts commercial which has been played approximately a uh, gazillion times the last 10 years. I just picture him saying stuff like, Mi nombre is Alejandro. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto parts. Uh, all right, quick recap. Louisiana was French, was in danger of becoming British territory, then was given to Spain. And then mobs in New Orleans run off the first Spanish governor, and then Canadians still think Louisiana is French. This spells one big old identity crisis for this area. Not only is there a crisis of leadership, there's also just in general an enormous variety of ethnicities, religions, and nationalities living in New Orleans since it's a port city. There were French, Spanish, and British residents, as well as an enormous slave population, immigrants from the Caribbean islands, German, Irish, and Italian immigrants, and more. When the U.S. government took over ownership of cosmopolitan New Orleans on December 20th, 1803, when Madame Delphine is only 16, it acquired a city that immediately ranked as the ninth largest in the country and a port with extensive trade networks throughout Europe, North America, the Caribbean, Latin America. At the time, only one-ninth of the city's population was of African origin. The city more than doubled in size after 10,000 refugees from the 1794 to 1804 rebellion in Haiti found a new home in New Orleans in 1809. The St. Domingue refugees included French colonists, free Creoles of color, ex-slaves, many of whom were returned to bondage after setting foot on American shores. How much does that fucking suck? Right? You just fight in a rebellion. You know, you're, you win your freedom. You sail over to America. They're like, ha! Surprise, motherfucker! You're back! We got you again! God, that would suck. Uh, 1810 census records the city population is about one-third white, one-third free people of color, one-third African slaves. Uh, you know, who constituted obviously the bottom of the labor market and the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. The melding of all these cultural backgrounds gave rise to the term Creole, as it was used in the New World. Uh, the term Creole was first used in the 16th century to identify descendants of French, Spanish, or Portuguese settlers living in the West Indies and Latin America. Uh, there is general agreement that the term Creole derives from the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese word Criolo, uh, which means a slave born in the master's household. Probably also didn't pronounce that one, right? My Portuguese, not good. Single definition sufficed in the early days of European colonial expansion, but as Creole populations established divergent social, political, and economic identities, the term acquired different meanings, which is why it's gotten so confusing today. In the West Indies, Creole refers to a descendant of any European seller, uh, but some people of African descent also consider themselves to be Creole. In Louisiana, it mainly identifies French-speaking populations of French or Spanish descent, 
uh, people whose ancestors were upper-class whites, many of whom were plantation owners or officials during the French and Spanish colonial periods. During the 18th and 19th century, they formed a separate caste that used French. Uh, they were Catholics. They retained the traditional cultural traits of related social groups in France, but they were the first French group to be submerged by Anglo-Americans. However, Creole doesn't just define these people. My, this is one of the slippiest fucking words ever. Uh, many Creoles are descendants of French colonials who fled St. Domingue, Haiti, for North America's Gulf Coast when a slave insurrection that we talked about, you know, challenged French authority. Um, in Louisiana, the term Creole came to represent children of black or racially mixed parents, as well as children of French and Spanish descent with no racial mixing. Uh, persons of French and Spanish descent in New Orleans and St. Louis began referring to themselves as Creoles after the Louisiana Purchase to set themselves apart from the Anglo-Americans moving into the area. Uh, are you confused enough by this word yet? Because it gets worse. My laptop dictionary gives four different racial definitions for Creole. It can be one, a person of mixed European and black descent, especially in the Caribbean. Two, a descendant of Spanish or other European settlers in the Caribbean or Central or South America. Three, a white descendant of French settlers in Louisiana and other parts of the Southern U.S. Uh, four, a leprechaun of above average height born in the Western Hemisphere, but with ancestry coming mainly from the Eastern Hemisphere, specifically either Ethiopia, Somalia, but not Madagascar, who is fond of unicorns, but doesn't actually own one because why the fuck not? Of course, I just made up that last one, uh, but the real definition is, is ridiculous. The same word can be used to describe a person of mixed European and black descent, or a white descendant of French settlers, probably living in Louisiana, but not necessarily living in Louisiana and a whole bunch of other meetings. Back in Madame Delphine's day, Creole was used to refer to early Louisiana colonists of French descent who had been born in Louisiana and were thus native to the territory compared to new immigrants from France or elsewhere. And, uh, and then to make it even more confusing, there's the Cajun situation. Cajun versus Creole. I used to confuse Creoles with Cajuns all the time because, frankly, it's very fucking easy to do. And no one outside of Louisiana, for the most part, gives a shit. Uh, Cajuns and Creoles are both people of French descent. The two groups just arrived in Louisiana in different ways. While the Creoles are, are, are a little bit more native, to, well, a little more, they're native to Louisiana, again, for the most part, Jesus. Cajuns are the ethnic group that began uh, in Eastern Canada. Those French settlers who formed that colony of Acadia that lasted from 1604 to 1713. We've talked about it before. Uh, Acadia included the maritime provinces, parts of Quebec, even parts of Maine. These are the people that were, uh, we talked about earlier, that were kicked out of Acadia by the British in the mid-18th century when they refused to bow down to a new crown. And they ended up getting exiled down into Louisiana because they thought it was still controlled by the French. So many came into Louisiana that a large section of southern Louisiana is known as Acadiana, uh, a French Louisiana region that comprises 22 of Louisiana's 64 parishes, which are like their counties. Again, sorry, I know that was a long tangent. Uh, again, in Madame Delphine's day, Creole used to refer to early Louisiana colonists of French descent. My God, such a good example of how confusing our language can truly be. Communication can be so challenging because sometimes what you think a word means is different than what the person you're speaking with thinks that word means. And sometimes communication is challenging because the actual definition of the word in question is constantly evolving and at times contradictory. And this word to me represents today's kind of episode as well. If, if This was an especially confusing uh, suck to research. I think we got it. I think we got it. But it was tough because there are so many varying accounts all over the place about what actually happened. The dates and the names get mixed around and tossed around and, you know, and changed. And there's four different accounts of what this person supposedly did and eight different accounts of what that person supposedly did. Uh, that's, that's why sometimes on the updates, you know, you guys send in some messages, which are awesome, but we don't read them all because a lot of times it's just an alternative, uh, you know, um, example of what the history might've been. And we just happen to go with a different one. Oh man, why can't history be fucking perfect? Okay, now back to the subject of the suck. So what was life like for a French Creole named Madame Delphine? With imported furniture, wines, books, and clothes, white Creoles were immersed in a completely French atmosphere in America. It's all fancy and elegantly European. She lived a very fancy life uh, in, in, in all likelihood. We're all virtually positive of that. Uh, white Creoles clung to their individualistic way of life, frowned upon intermarriage with Anglo-Americans and others, refused to learn English, were resentful and contemptuous of Protestants. They considered them irreligious and wicked. Uh, they really didn't care for voodoo and hoodoo. We're going to find, find that out later. Uh, Creoles generally succeeded in remaining separate in the rural sections, but they steadily lost ground in New Orleans. In 1803, there were seven Creoles to every Anglo-American in New Orleans, but these figures dwindled to two to one by 1830. 
Anglo-Americans reacted by disliking the Creoles with equal enthusiasm. Gradually, New Orleans became not one city, but two. Canal Street split them apart, dividing the old Creole city from the uptown section where the other Americans quickly settled. Okay, a lot of context now. Now back to the timeline. In 1802, France regains control of Louisiana. So La Lurie is born into Spanish Louisiana, which then switches to French Louisiana in 1802 and then becomes a U.S. territory in 1803 because France didn't plan on keeping Louisiana because France is now run by Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, who, as we know, uh, needed the money to finance all his wars in Europe, as we just learned a few weeks ago, and that suck. Uh, Napoleon sold Louisiana to the U.S. and President Thomas Jefferson. Now that we've gone through all the versions of Louisiana that existed in La Lurie's life, Let's get to her actual life as best we can right after a word from today's sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Away Travel. Away offers high quality luggage at a much lower price by cutting out the middleman, selling directly to you. You can choose from nine colors and four different sizes, the carry-on, the bigger carry-on, uh, both of which are compliant with all major U.S. airlines, the medium or the large. All suitcases are made with premium German polycarbonate, which is lightweight, unrivaled in strength and impact resistance, and the 360-degree spinner wheels guarantee a smooth ride. Uh, best of all, both sizes of the carry-on are able to charge anything that's powered by a USB cord. And thanks to the lifetime warranty, if anything breaks, Away will fix or replace it. So try it out for 100 days, and if at any point you decide it's not for you, uh, return it for a full refund, no questions asked. I've been using my Away bigger carry-on for months and months now. It's, it's been getting a lot of miles, doing a lot of touring with it. It's fantastic. The USB charger conveniently just ejects. You just push down, it pops out from the top of the suitcase. Uh, you can cover it up when you don't want that to happen, and then you can take it out, as I do, when you have to hop on your plane. I put it in the seat pocket in front of me and just let it charge either my phone or my iPad the whole flight. I've tested it, and when the charger is fully charged, I charge it overnight before my trip. It'll charge an iPhone over four times completely. So I never worry about running out of juice with this little suitcase. It's rugged, takes a beating, a lot better than other carry-ons I've had. And it just looks cool, which is always a nice plus. You know, this isn't your grandma's floral print carry-on. It's slick and modern. You should get one. You should save money doing so. For $20 off of one of these suitcases, visit awaytravel.com slash timesuck. Use promo code timesuck during checkout. That's awaytravel.com slash timesuck. Use the promo code timesuck for $20 off a suitcase. Discount link in the episode description. Sponsor button in the timesuck app. Now let's bounce on over to 1787. Most likely year of Madame Delphine's birth. Uh, Marie Delphine McCarty was born in New Orleans. That was her original maiden name. Uh, and most accounts, yeah, do claim she was born March 19th, 1787 as one of five children. Both of her parents were wealthy and uh, well-established slave-owning members of the New Orleans European Creole community. Slave ownership at that time was very widespread and was seen as a sign of wealth. Uh, it was like a status sign. We'll look into that deeper. But the, but the gist was that uh, the more slaves one owned, the more powerful and prestigious they were. The culture of New Orleans at the time was a culture engulfed in the slave trade. Many of the whites without slaves wanted them, and many people, regardless of needing help around their home or not, would just own like one slave uh, just for the status it brought. How, how strange is that reality that at one time, not that long ago in this country, people were buying other people, other meat sacks for the same reason a lot of people today get a new iPhone or, or put in a pool to impress their friends and neighbors. Keeping up with the Joneses meant sometimes buying other people who may have actually been named the Joneses not that long ago. It's crazy. Uh, Creole Delphine's Creole mother, now I just want to say Creole all the time, was Marie Jean Leorbel, uh, also known as the widow Lecomte, as Louis uh, B. McCarty was her second husband, came from a very wealthy French family with deep ties to the French aristocracy that can even be traced back to the Emperor Napoleon. Delphine's father was uh, Louis uh, Bartholomew de, de McCarty, originally Chevalier uh, de McCarthy, uh, a knight in the service of the king, descended from a long line of French military officers from a very prominent Irish family. They sound prominent, right? With that, all those fancy ass names. You know, it's not like her parents were named Doug and Becky. That would have been hilarious. My name is Marie Delphine Mercarté. These are my parents, Doug and Becky. Uh, the McCartys were a Creole family of distinction in New Orleans, and the descendants of the two pioneers who brought the name uh, to Louisiana are numerous today among the first families of that state. The McCartys, originally McCarthys, were ancient Irish folks, one of whom, Bartholomew, was a yeah, captain in the Irish regiment of Abermall. 
Uh, he fled his native Ireland to France to escape the political and religious tyranny of the English kings at that time. He married a woman whose name seems to be forgotten to history. And then, yeah, then they had five kids. Two of Bartholomew's uh, sons, uh, Jean Jacques and uh, Bartholomew Daniel de Macarte, migrated together to Louisiana in 1732 as French colonial and the, and the officers and the Creole McCarty line began. Uh, Jean Jacques became a knight of the Order of St. Louis. Bartholomew Daniel was Madame Delphine's grandfather. Um, so yeah, so she's got an impressive lineage. The first 13 years of Delphine's childhood between 1787 and 1800 are not well documented, uh, which is a bummer, right? We don't, we don't have any early stories about her pushing another kid into a well or coming home from playing out in the swamp one day, covered in blood with a knife in her hand, claiming not to know where she's been the past few hours. You know, on the same day, a playmate goes missing forever. There's no stories of her parents catching her skin in a family pet alive while merrily humming some uh, church hymns. You know, know, nothing to point to and be like, aha, see? She had to have tortured those poor people when she got older. She was clearly a psychopath. If Delphine did commit weird, cruel, shady acts as a kid, we don't know about it. Based on her family being a noted Creole family of the area, she was most likely raised in luxury and comfort and did her best not to be, uh, you know, considered improper for a young lady of high society. As the daughter of a well-bred Creole family, she would have been taught to read and write. Uh, the bulk of her education probably would have consisted of music, art lessons, and etiquette. She would have learned the art of running a household from her mother. Uh, to speak a bit more towards Delphine's family status, her aunt, Marie uh, Celeste Eleanor de Macarte, was married to Esteban Rodriguez Miro, the governor of the Spanish-American provinces of Louisiana and Florida during 1785 to 1791. Kind of a big deal. And her cousin, uh, Augustin de Macarte, would go on to become the mayor of New Orleans from 1815 to 1820. Also kind of a big deal. She was a lady of high society. Her family was one of the most, you know, uh, uh, high-status families in all of New Orleans. She was raised to be a socialite, a debutante. And, uh, and basically, she and her family were about the closest thing to uh, American aristocrats, you know, we've ever had. Delphine was most likely coddled and pampered. Like others raised by slave owners, her and her family's lives were intertwined with the lives of the people they bought and sold. There were rumors that Delphine's father slept with, a.k.a. raped, let's be honest, uh, some of his slaves, and that he kept a black mistress. Some would later point towards Delphine's father's sexual relationship with his slaves as a possible motivation for the cruel things she would supposedly do to her slaves later in her life, right? Like, did she blame her slaves uh, or slaves in general, I guess, for soiling her father's reputation? Did she blame a slave woman for, for harming her father's relationship with her mother? Did she experience a lot of behind the scenes emotional turmoil lost to history that was related to slavery somehow? Is, is that why she may have cruelly tortured people in her New Orleans now haunted, you know, abode all these years later, well, you know, or many years later. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, we do know Delphine was raised around a lot of slavery, which you could say about virtually anyone living in Louisiana at that time. But not everyone at that time was actually raised on a plantation like Delphine was. In 1771, 16 years before her birth, her family became Southern plantation owners. Is that year Delphine's grandparents, Francois uh, Helene P uh, Pellerin, and Bartholomew Daniel de Macarte, they were gifted a plantation. We think this happened in 1771. Several genealogy sites say that Bartholomew died in 1764, but those sites, in my experience, not entirely accurate. Not accurate nearly as much as I would like. Uh, and some old Louisiana court records from 1941 cite an earlier 20th century Louisiana judge and historian, Judge Charles Gaillier, as saying that Delphine's grandfather was the tutor of the children of a man named Jean-Baptiste Cesar Le Breton, and that Jean was murdered by a petted and pampered slave. That's a quote. And in his will, apparently, he passed his plantation down to Bartholomew Daniel McCarthy, who received it in 1771. I'm going to go with the court record. And how fucked up is the petted and pampered description, by the way? My God. Guessing that was written by someone back in the later 18th century who was incredibly pro-slavery and insanely abusive. That's why you can't pamper them, Cornelius. Uh, the slightest bit of pampering or petting, and they will kill you. Constant beatings are required for the safety of everyone and for the very integrity of Southern society. Uh, there's no disagreement amongst historians about whether or not Delphine was raised by New Orleans area plantation owners. Uh, that we know for sure. She would grow up around injustices and violence of American plantation slavery, typically far more violent and demeaning than American uh, house slavery, I guess, if you will. 
And make no mistake, all slavery was bad, but some slaves were treated far worse than others, and usually the worst treated slaves were plantation slaves. On March 26, 1800, Delphine gets married for the first time, and if you're good at math, that means she had just turned 13 years old. <laughs> Yay! Had her 13th birthday, uh, you know, had her party on the 19th, and then was uh, laying naked under the body of her new, uh, you know, uh, naked and not 13-year-old full-grown husband, you know, just a short time later. Now, to be fair, you will find a fair amount of disagreement on the, on the web about this. Some sources say she was born in 1775. I, I don't believe those sources. And, and, and again, this suck was super frustrating in that regard. Uh, while she, to me, and many others, is an incredibly interesting historical figure, no noted biographer or historian, you know, uh, has actually written like a, like a real definitive biography about her. And I think part of the reason is that a lot of the info about her is inconsistent and hard to feel certain about. And when she was growing up, nobody knew that she would become an incredibly interesting historical figure. The deed she became infamous for happened much later in her life. So, you know, no one thought to write that shit down early on. Uh, I've seen pictures of her alleged tombstone. There's a website called Find a Grave that has been, in my experience, pretty accurate. Uh, I've used it to verify a lot of victims' ages and, and death dates, you know, in previous true crime sucks. And the name and dates it gives have consistently lined up with the name and dates I've been able to find in other sources. And according to this site, she was born in 1787 tombstone picture they have for her shows her death date, but not her birthday. Uh, I know sometimes I go into too much detail with this type of shit, but I just want you to know that we work hard not to bullshit you with information. And unfortunately, that's not the norm. Uh, I wish that, I wish that came from my sources more often, you know, just an occasional note of, Hey, we think this is what happened. We don't know for sure. We did our best. Anyways, it appears that she really did get married at 13. The vast majority of the most reputable sources seem to insist this. And, uh, and back at the turn of the 19th century, it actually made more sense for a woman to get married when she was 13 than it did uh, for a woman to get married at 25, uh, which is if you trust the other date of her birth, which would have been actually considered pretty undesirable. The average age of marriage was closer to 20 at that time, but 25, that was ancient, right? For a first marriage, right? Like people would have wondered what was wrong with her, right? She would have been an old maid at 25, already lost uh, over 10 years of her prime baby making time. You know, what's, what's going on with her? Why didn't, why didn't any man want this, want this bride? 25-year-old bride was likely a widow who already had a few kids of her own. Talk about different times. During the 19th century, the age of consent in the United States actually varied between 10 and 16, depending on the state and the year. 10. As the father of an 11-year-old daughter, that is so deeply disturbing to me. And people say today that kids are growing too fast. Get the fuck out of here. Not compared to 1800 Louisiana. Uh, you know, you just caught your 15-year-old getting drunk. Who gives a shit? Does your 15-year-old have a 5-year-old with a 40-year-old? Are they already a widow? Uh, if so, then yeah. Then they're growing up, uh, you know, pretty fast. If not, then they're, they're not growing up nearly as fast as so many kids who have grown up quickly before them. My son's 13. I can't imagine Kyler getting married either. Ah, oh, his wife would have to have a lot of patience for his relentless meme references. Uh, he'd have to be cool with a dude who doesn't play with stuffed animals, you know, anymore, but also won't let us get rid of him. Uh, the marriage ceremony was held at the St. Louis Cathedral by the first bishop of the uh, Diocese of Louisiana. Uh, the marriage certificate was signed by celebrated Spanish priest Antonio de Sedea, a man whose ghost is said to walk an alley now named for him, which runs alongside a New Orleans cathedral. That alley, Père Antoine Alley, uh, and a restaurant in the city's historic French Quarter are named after this dude. And, uh, and after the uh, ceremony, the priest allegedly high-fived Delphine's husband and then just leaned in real close and just said, ha, now I, now I get it, man. I get it. I get it. I like him even younger than that myself. But don't, only the boys. Only those sweet, sexy, innocent little fuck boys. Sorry, not sorry. I know that's messed up, but based on how many cases of priest pedophilia I've read about the past few decades, I can only imagine the amount of Catholic molestation that was going on back in parishes at that time. Uh, Delphine's husband was described in this document as uh, Caballero de la Royal de Carlos, uh, intendant of the provinces, a native of the community of Regno Galicia, Spain, and the legitimate son of Lordship Don Jose Antonio de Lopez y Anguela, y Dona Ana Fernande de Aguela, daughter of Dona Francisca Borja Odysseus. Fucking get out of here with all those titles. Jesus, like 75 words. Uh, welcome to, <laughs> I don't know why I started going Scandinavian. His name is Don Ramon Lopez. History is not clear as to how much older he was. Some research does say he was at least in his 50s when they got married. Fucking gross. 
Some 13-year-old sent off uh, to a wedding bed with grandpa. Hopefully this is not correct and he was much younger. But you know what? Even if he was half that age, if he's 25, still pretty gross. Even if he was half of that, if he was like 13, all, it's all pretty gross. Madam Delphine's first marriage is scandalous, but actually not for age-related reasons. Her high-ranking military officer husband married this 13-year-old girl without the consent of the King of Spain, which was a big no-no. That went against governmental protocol. 13-year-old vagina, all well and good, but you have to get the king's permission before you touch it. Maybe he wanted to lean in, say some weird, creepy shit. Just tell me later what it's like, Mr. Lopez. I want every detail. When you've taken a cherry, quickly write down uh, every moment of the encounter. I'll, I'll put it in a book with the others. Oh, my priest and I like to read it together at night. I'm sure there's other reasons for the king uh, needing to uh, give him permission. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, shit was super weird and gross back then, but I hope so. Don Ramon was stripped of his office, ordered to return to the Spanish courts for marrying without the king's permission. Uh, maybe, here again, the accounts vary. Fucking stupid accounts. Here's the possibilities in either 1804 or maybe even late 1803, after the American acquisition of the Louisiana Territory that we just went over earlier, Don Ramon uh, seems to have been appointed to the position of Consul General for Spain in the Territory of Orleans. Delphine and Ramon uh, traveled to Spain in 1804. Varying accounts of this trip exist. Grace King, a late 19th and early 20th century New Orleans author and historian, wrote in 1921 that the trip was Lopez's military punishment and that Senora Delphine Lopez met the queen who was impressed with Mrs. Lopez's beauty. A 1936 account by Stanley Arthur, who wrote for the Encyclopedia Britannica in the early 20th century, stated that on March 26, 1804, Don Ramon Lopez was recalled to Spain to take his place at court as befitting his new position. Uh, but that Lopez never arrived in Madrid because he died en route in Havana. And all of the uh, uh, accounts seem to verify that he did die in Cuba. Um, on March 26, 1804, Ramon uh, de Lopez y Anguela, Anguelo is pardoned for his grievous lack of requesting marital permission. He just wanted that 13-year-old so bad. Uh, he's pardoned again once Spain gives Louisiana to the United States, and he's granted an important political position in New Orleans, we think. And then, yes, en route uh, uh, via the American ship Ulysses, the ship runs aground. Ramon dies of a heart failure before ever reaching his destination. He's buried in Havana. During the voyage, Delphine gives birth to a daughter named Marie Borgia. Borgia, Delphine Lopez y Anguelo, de la Candelaria, nicknamed Borguita, uh, Borquita, after Don Ramon's grandmother, uh, Dona Francisca. And then Delphine and her daughter return to New Orleans afterwards. After Don Ramon's death, Delphine will be a single mom for four years. Very young single mom roughly 17 years old. Uh, presumably, uh, much of her mother and duties were done uh, by servants since she was known to party down. But there are accounts that, uh, you know, that speak to her adoring and doting on all of her children. She'd have several others throughout her life. You're also going to find others later accounts as she gets older that she was possibly very abusive to her kids. Um, okay, so let's look at her next marriage. You know, we're going to examine all three of her marriages uh, thoroughly because when little is written about someone, uh, you know, basically the next best thing you can do is to examine the lives they were intertwined with to at least get some insight into their life. And, and a fair amount was written about her husband's, especially the last two, uh, mostly the second, this guy. 21-year-old Delphine remarried on June 16th, 1808 to a man named Jean-Pierre uh, Paulin Blanc, who was an attorney, banker, lawmaker, slave trader, and uh, as you'll see soon, a pirate. Uh, Delphine and Jean Blanc would have four children together who were born at the residence at 409 Royal Street. Currently, uh, IDA Mannheim Antiques in New Orleans occupies that address. If you want to stop in and check it out. New Orleans is such a fun city that way. Uh, it's rare for America to have a place, you know, where the residence of someone who lived a few hundred years ago is still around and in use today. I mean, I know in Europe, you know, places like that are a dime a dozen, but pretty special still on this side of the pond. Uh, Delphine and Jean's uh, eldest uh, was daughter Marie Louise Jean. Their other three children's names were Jean Louise. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jean Louis uh, Leonard Lalori is the name he would you know end up with later. Uh, Louis Marie Lar Blanc and Marie Louis Pauline Blanc. Uh, Delphine Lalori's mother uh, Marie Jean died of natural causes the year before on February 26, 1807, and left her daughter $33,000 that would become her dowry. Uh, in addition to whatever, actually it was technically $33,070, which is a lot of money in that time. You know, uh, in addition to whatever accumulation of slaves Blanc managed on his own, he was also gifted 26 more slaves by Delphine's father at the time of her wedding. 
Uh, also in 1808, Jean Blanc was gifted his first plantation. So strange to me to be gifted actual people at a wedding. It's such a different time. It sometimes feels like a completely different world. A uh, little backstory on Mr. Blanc, who sounds like a French clue character. It was Mr. Blanc in the foyer with a ball peen hammer. Jean Blanc came to New Orleans in 1803, and luckily for today's tale, we know quite a bit about him. Uh, Jean's known in some circles as the godfather of the modern carnival. America's first carny, if you will. Uh, traveling carnivals did exist in France in some form for several years, but nothing substantial. Uh, Jean is the guy who apparently put carnivals on the map. Uh, he's credited with the uh, invention of the ring toss, balloon dart game, uh, much to the delight of Louisiana children and then children across the world. He was the first to figure out that you could trick fathers into spending the equivalent of $200 uh, to win a $5 stuffed animal for their daughter or girlfriend or wife. He made a fucking fortune. And he would, uh, and it would be this carny money that would lead to the dark legend of Madame Delphine. Uh, all right. Okay. He wasn't a carny, but he did invent elephant ears. No, he didn't. Uh, we do know a lot about him, though. We do. Uh, Jean-Pierre's signature actually appears on the original copy of the Constitution of the State of Louisiana, uh, dated January 22nd, 1812. It's displayed at the historic New Orleans collection. Pretty cool. Uh, you don't get to do that when you're a carny. No, uh, uh, that's some high society shit. Speaks to Delphine's social status. And this is her second husband. You don't get a second husband of that stature unless you yourself are amongst the uh, upper crust of the social elite and pretty hot. She was supposedly very attractive. Apparently, her beauty had not totally faded by the time she was at ancient age of 21. Uh, when Delphine's first marriage could be described, uh, or while Delphine's first marriage could be described as kind of brief and gross, her second marriage really speaks to how important she was in early New Orleans history. As we alluded to earlier, New Orleans was a big deal in the early 19th century. It was already one of the biggest cities in the South. It was growing fast. It would become actually the third largest city in the U.S. by 1840 before flatlining population-wise between the Civil War and the Great Depression. And Jean-Pierre, he had a prominent role in early Orleans history. Uh, Jean Blanc was a successful banker, merchant, as I said, plantationer, entrepreneur, lawyer, legislator, slave trader, and fucking privateer. Pirate. He may not have worn an eye patch or had a parrot named Polly or had a peg leg or carried a cool sword or swashbuckled or even one time uttered, well, shavel me timbers. You ain't sending this scallywag to David Jones' locker today. All matey. Uh, he probably didn't say that while squinting one eye real hard and clamping his, you know, fuck, fucked up teeth down on a corn cob pipe billowing smoke as black as gunpowder. But he was technically a pirate. Delphine's second husband actually played a very important role in saving America's independence from crumbling in the War of 1812. The first real mention of Jean Blanc historically is him walking off a French frigate called the Sur Surveillant onto uh, Louisiana soil. Napoleon's right-hand Louisiana man, Pierre Clement Lassau, or Lassau, uh, also was Blanc's cousin, was on the same ship during that same long trip from France. Uh, uh, Lossa was Napoleon's appointment to be prefect of the colony after the 1803 transfer from Spain to France of the Louisiana Territory. After the sale to America, uh, this Lossa character left New Orleans, but Blanc remained behind. Jean Blanc came to Louisiana fairly rich, pretty powerful, pretty connected, and he just seemed to do even better in New Orleans. He declared himself a citizen of Louisiana immediately and just got right down into local politics. Records show that within the first year of him being in Louisiana, he owned three big ships, including one uh, called the Citizen. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that these ships were at the very least rented out to privateers to do a bunch of pirate shit if he wasn't a pirate in some sense himself. The main trade for Blanc uh, was colloquially called a very dehumanizing term, black ivory. The fruits of his piracy were slaves, along with other valuable items. Uh, we found court documents that he was once prosecuted in court for his involvement in, in the matter of 27,000 pounds of coffee being stolen from America. So, so weird. Steal whatever you want from uh, any of our enemies, including actual people. But you take our coffee? Ha! I'll see you in court, you son of a bitch. Times are so different uh, then uh, compared to now in so many different ways. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine the equivalent now? Our only direct neighbors now are Canada and Mexico, and we get along with both of them pretty well. Right, We never have any real dust-ups with Canada. and There's immigration tensions with Mexico, but we're not like actively hostile to them. Not, not in ways that were tolerated 200 years ago. I mean, you couldn't now drive down to Tijuana, rob a few banks, take a few families of people, have their authorities chase you to the border, then race past the checkpoint and just get high-fived by a bunch of American officers. Ha, dude, that shit was epic, man. Oh, man, we're going to have to have you pay us back for the barricade you broke through. Uh, through. But not the other barricade. No, that's theirs. Ha. <laughs> Now, nah, fuck them, uh, but ours. 
looks like you snatched up some serious pesos. Good job, man. Good job, brother. U S A. U S A. That's that's kind of what life was like back then, right? Our shipping merchants could ransack the merchants of some other nation's ship, and then we as a nation would be like, ah, fucking cool, man. Sweet. Yeah, good job. You know, if that other nation was like, hey, not cool. Give us that crook so we can try him in court. Nah, bro, fuck off. Oh, all right, I see how it is. I see it. That's fine. I'll just push my anger down. And then eventually it'll boil up and we'll declare war on you assholes. Uh, slavery was definitely Jean Blanc's main trade. His methods and tactics were certainly technically illegal, but not uh, only was he not chastised for his profession, he was held in high regard, as privateers often were. Uh, the New Orleans banks looked the other way, even quietly supported this pirate and the trade in general for the injection of cash flow that came from it. Uh, the general public did not ostracize these slave traders. Even though, as we'll find out soon, it was technically illegal at that time. Now we have to delve into this guy's role in what many uh, might say saved America in the War of 1812. The husband of Madame Delphine heavily involved in the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, the Battle of New Orleans would, would be a pivotal moment in American history. It was the first major battle of the War of 1812. I'm sorry, not first. Final, 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 final. Ugh. Ah, I can sense people getting on their keyboard. No, 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 no. Actually, it's a, yeah, final. Uh, we learned in the Andrew Jackson suck. Technically, it occurred after the war was already over, kind of. The treaty that uh, ended the war actually stipulated that the fighting would stop once the treaty was ratified, which didn't actually happen until February of 1815. Uh, the British were hoping that when the war ended, they would own New Orleans and be able to control trade on the Mississippi. Blanc, his pirate friends, the Lafitte brothers, and Madame Delphine's own family's home would uh, become, become some of the deciding factors in the British defeat in this war. If it had played out differently, our world might look very different today. The War of 1812, sometimes called the Forgotten War, its importance often underplayed and misrepresented because it's sandwiched between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Uh, the War of 1812, kind of like the Korean War, right? It's sandwiched, you know, in between uh, World War II and Vietnam, it just doesn't get the same press. Uh, the War of 1812 uh, hadn't been going, on, been going well for the now adolescent Uncle Sam. America had suffered many defeats. The White House had been burned down. Nearly all of the coastline was being blockaded. Americans were also defeated on the Great Lakes. Only a few ports in New England were still operational. The formidable Br British Navy had effectively made the U.S. an island surrounded by Her Majesty's Finest. All they really needed for completion of their plan for victory was control of the Mississippi River, the Mississippi Delta. London was uh, confident that Americans would soon surrender. To put an end to the fighting, the Crown sent an armada of 50 ships and 11,000 soldiers, sailors, and Marines to capture New Orleans. The armada was led by Sir Edmund Parkenham. He would go ahead to uh, he would go head to head with American President James Madison's leadership choice, General Andrew Jackson. He of the most controversial suck, the man who lived 200 years ago, whose uh, very name still polarizes people today. As I found out, and I get it. I'm sure some of you right now are like, "God damn it, this guy again!" I quit listening for a while last time he showed up. Why why are we talking about this racist shithead again? Well, because you can't rewrite history. That's why. Actually, you can. And people do all the time, which is fucking ridiculous to me. It's emotionally weak to me, right? The truth is what it is. What good really comes from hiding it or sugarcoating it? Uh, General Jackson arrived in New Orleans December 1st, 1814, required an interpreter to communicate with the mainly French-speaking people who live there. Fucking Creoles. Jackson quick, quickly put together an opposition force full of French and Spanish Creoles, free men of color, slaves, German farmers, frontiersmen, militia, actual soldiers, and a shit ton of pirates the melting pot of early America mixed into one early fighting force. Madame Delphine McCarty Blanc was 39 when war came to her home, and she directly witnessed some of the fighting. She was pregnant with her fourth child at the time, had been married to Jean-Pierre Blanc for six years. Uh, the Blancs owned a great deal of property, including their home on Royal Street, their townhouse next to the Bank of Louisiana, where Jean-Pierre worked, and they spent their summers at the Blanc Plantation that was right next to the Delphine's family plantation on the Mississippi River, not far from New Orleans. A lot of residences in the area, which sounds crazy, e even for the wealthy, until you remember they didn't have cars back then, right? It took fucking, it took forever to get across town, right? When you're getting pulled behind some stupid horse. No, thank you. You know, back then, I would have wanted several homes right here in Coeur d'Alene if I was living here, if that meant avoiding a 45-minute horse ride. Uh, when Jean-Pierre did uh, well financially as a public member of commerce, his greatest source of income came from his above-board pirating and smuggling. Uh, he was a silent partner of two of the most famous of the Pirates of the Caribbean, the real ones, Jean and Pierre Lafitte. I'd actually never heard of these swashbucklers before the suck. Or if I did, I've already forgotten about them. Uh, I love it when the exploration of, of one character leads to getting to know so many other cool figures. Hail Nimrod. 
It had been illegal to import new slaves in the U.S. ever since 1808. This is why some of the banks were kind of on the on the hush hush about supporting these guys. This law, uh, though, created a highly profitable illegal slave trade market, and that market made Blanc and the Lafitte brothers a lot of money, which then made uh, you know Madame Delphine Lalaurie a lot of money. By 1814, Jean Lafitte had become public enemy number one in Louisiana, uh, thanks to um, uh, brazenly ignoring the slave trade law, because you know while the banks didn't didn't mind, some other people didn't care for it, and then sometimes you know took shit like coffee from you know the actual Americans, and that pissed people off. And, and his brother Pierre had been caught and incarcerated for this pirating. Uh, the Louisiana government, sick of this particular pirate, and its governor William Claiborne offered a five hundred dollar reward for the capture of Jean Lafitte. And then check out this pirate move. Lafitte responded by putting out a $1,500 reward for the capture of Governor Claiborne. Touche, motherfucker. <laughs> That's so fantastic. I'll see your reward and I'll raise it with a bigger bounty on your head. That's like the police showing up and, and arresting someone only to have that person immediately slip out of their handcuffs and then arrest that police officer. No, you're arrested. What? No, you're arrested. No, you are. You were first. Stop it. Uh, the British were like, we love this dude. He clearly is not a fan of the governor. I bet we can get him to join our team in this war. The British were all too aware of Lafitte's many ships, cannons, and very well-trained men. They approached the pirate with the rank of captain in the Royal Navy if he would just join them in their attack of America. Lafitte thought it over and then decided to, uh, to work a different angle. He wrote many letters, one of which went on to Delphine's husband, revealing what the British had offered to Lafitte. I love me an old-timey letter. Here is what Lafitte wrote to Madame Delphine's second husband, Jean Blanc, in 1814. It's dated 4th September, 1814. Sir, though proscribed by my adoptive country, I will never let slip any occasion of serving her or of proving that she has never ceased to be dear to me. Uh, Prescribe, by the way, means condemned, denounced, or forbidden. And and I don't add that out of being patronizing and assuming that you, dear time sucker, don't know what it means. I add it because I didn't know what it meant. I thought he just misspelled prescribe, like to be prescribed medicine. And I was like, what the fuck? How is, how is his adopted country prescribed him? What? What have they prescribed you, dude? No, they've condemned him. Back to the letter. Of this, you will see here a convincing proof. Yesterday, the 3rd of September, there appeared here under a flag of truce a boat coming from an English brig at anchor about two leagues from the pass. Mr. Nicholas Lockyer, a British officer of high rank, delivered me the following papers, two directed to me, a proclamation, and the admiral's instructions to that officer all herewith enclosed. You will see from their contents the advantages I might have derived from that kind of association. I may have evaded the the department of duties of the custom house, but I have never ceased to be a good citizen. And all the offense I have committed, I was forced to by certain vices in our loss. I love his pirate rationalization. This is what I hear him saying. You know, look, you guys. I know, I know we've had our differences and shit. You guys, you know, you have your laws and whatnot. But to be totally honest, I don't, listen, I don't give a fuck about those laws, right? I'm going to be real. I chose not to follow those laws. And that, that's how I live my best life. But check this shit out. I am proud to be an American. Know that. And overall, other than the laws, I continually broke. Because if I'm going to be totally honest, I had to because those laws are super fucked up. And they're kind of hurting my business, if you feel me. So really. It's your fault to make dumb laws that I had to break to be a good American. Because like I'm like a straight-A student when it comes to protecting the red, white, and blue. That's, to me, what he's saying. Back to the letter. He says, in short, sir, I make the depository of the secret on which perhaps depends the tranquility of our country. Please to make such use of it as your judgment may direct. Oh, dude was confident. So, you know, man, you know, bro, you got to do you. But if you guys blow me off, ha. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, because we both know, with my help, the British are going to utterly motherfuck you in your whole world. So, you know, you do what you feel is right for you. Uh, I may expatiate on this proof of patriotism. Uh, Expatiate means to speak or write at length or in detail. I didn't know that one either. But I let the fact speak for itself. I presume, however, to hope that such proceedings may obtain amelioration. The act of making something better. Really didn't know that one. Of the situation of my unhappy brother, with which view I recommend him particularly to your influence. Now, I read that as, bro, I'm a patriot. You know that. That's the main reason I want to help. However, my brother is in prison. And I would like to think that if I help you out, you know, 
you can ameliorate the fuck out of his ass and get him out of that cell. You, you feel me? I'll help, but you let my brother go, all right? Then he keeps writing. It is in the bosom of a just man, of a true American, endowed with all qualities that are honored in society, that I think I am depositing the interest of our common country and what particularly concerns myself. Our enemies have endeavored to work on me by a motive which, which few men would have resisted. They represent it to be a brother in irons, a brother who is to me very dear, whose deliverer I might become, and I declined the proposal. Well persuaded of his innocence, I am free from apprehension as to the issue of a trial, but he is sick and not in a place where he can receive the assistance his state requires. I recommend him to you in the name of humanity. Listen, Jean Blanc, bro, please. The British told me they're going to bust my brother the fuck out. However, that may take a while, and he's sick, so I might not have a lot of time. You know what I'm saying? So how about you take care of him, and I take care of you? As to the flag of truce, I have done with regard to it everything that prudence suggests to me at that time. I have asked 15 days to determine. Assign such plausible pretext that I hope the term will be granted. I am waiting for the British officer's answer, and for yours to this. Be so good to assist me with your judicious counsel in so weighty an affair. I have the honor to salute you, Jean Lafitte. Well, out of all the people he could write this letter to, he writes to Madame Delphine's husband. He's writing, you know, essentially as to who he should help fight, the British or the Americans. And Jean Blanc, we can safely assume, advises him to side with America because that's exactly what he does. The shocked Governor Claiborne, uh, he thought this was a trick just to facilitate the escape of the Lafitte brother. It was not. Uh, it can be argued that his help actually turned the battle and thus the war, uh, you know, into uh, uh, America's, you know, good fortune. Had Madame Delphine's husband advised him differently, the map of the U.S. could look very differently today or theoretically not exist at all if you play out different scenarios. But Governor Claiborne, he almost ruined everything. He still wasn't convinced that Lafitte, the man who put a price on his head earlier, was earnest in his offer of aid and he ordered an attack on Lafitte's pirate headquarters. Luckily, the governor's men were no match for Lafitte's men. And then when uh, General Jackson... Uh, heard about this, not happy uh, with the governor's decision. He reached out to this pirate. It was like, oh, 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 before you go to the British, before Governor Claiborne fucks this up for all of us, let's talk. Uh, Delphine's husband, you know, continues to lobby the New Orleans government to take Lafitte's help. And then General Jackson, you know, ends up meeting this pirate on Royal Street with Lafitte, uh, you know, um, where he ac accepts the pirate's offer to help or meets with Lafitte, excuse me, where he accepts the pirate's offer to help. As fate would have it, the place chosen, chosen for the final battleground is the childhood home of Madame Delphine. The McCarthy Plantation is just a short distance down the river from New Orleans and was uh, then owned and operated by Delphine's cousin. Andrew Jackson would dig in and make stand there, uh, make his stand there. They would, you know, later help him catapult him to the presidency because it was a very successful stand. So Jackson's ragtag army brought Lafitte's cannons ashore, pointed them towards the sea. The British Navy attacked hard. Over a hundred cannons struck the McCarty plantation in the first 10 minutes of fighting, but the British aim was thankfully off. And then the pirate led American cannons wreaked havoc on the British fleet. Lafitte's men were battle hardened soldiers and their help made all the difference. The British suffered almost 2,500 casualties compared to just a handful of Americans. The British had to retreat and their leader, Sir Edmund uh, Parkenham was killed. This unexpected loss was a defining and unifying moment in the history of the United States. The U.S. had the collective will to come together in defense of their newly penned constitution and their hard-fought independence was won again. Andrew Jackson and Jean Lafitte both went on to become famous. Jean Blanc, however, ended up being relegated to being mostly known as the second husband of Madame Delphine. Pretty cool little piece of history there. Uh, also, for a little closure on this storyline here, Lafitte, the pirate, did earn a pardon for that brother and some other pirates who had been incarcerated by Governor Claiborne. Uh, they'd bounce on over to the waters outside of Galveston Island after the war, outside of Texas there, and build an army of pirates. They legitimately had an army of pirates. The brothers would also work as spies for Spain during Mexico's War of Independence. And then uh, Jean Lafitte is believed to have died after getting wounded in battle in 1823. Okay, last point on Delphine's life with Blanc. Although there aren't too many sources to corroborate this, it would seem... Uh, she became, uh, you know, fell into possession of a lot of rare and illegal items and substances from his privateering, and, uh, and that made her a lot of money. She's reported to have loved to host parties, increasingly lavish parties at the Blanc Mansion, and, uh, you know, probably had some pretty cool party favors. Probably the best damn sugar and coffee those pirates could steal. 
And so far, uh, yeah, so far in the suck, seems like she lived, you know, uh, a lavish, pampered, and and then scandal-free life in the sense that, uh, yeah, what she did was not, or what her husband did there was not necessarily moral, uh, obviously, but, um, you know, benefited her greatly and no, nobody locally cared. So, so far, no no dark, sinister uh, anything is associated with Madame Delphine. Uh, the only real tough break she seemed to have had is being a child bride. Um, in 1816, Jean-Pierre Blanc dies, widowing Delphine again, this time at the age of 29. Uh, some sources say he died in 18. Some sources say he didn't die, but fled and abandoned Delphine. No one seems to know how he died. Damn it. Probably died. Delphine spent the next 12 years as a single mother, a very rich, very powerful uh, single mother. We have almost no records of how she lived her life during this period. We don't know what she thought or what she talked about. We do have one court record uh, from 1819. In July 1819, court records show that Madame Delphine did something that initially doesn't seem like it matches up very well with the kind of person uh, you know, she would become infamous for being, someone you know, who tortured and killed slaves. The records of a parish court show that Marie Delphine McCarty, widow of the late Jean Blanc, uh, presented an emancipation petition to the court, noting that she intended to emancipate her male slave named Jean-Louis, uh, who was upwards of 50 years of age. She declared that Jean-Louis was all, had always led an honest conduct uh, with his life, had not run away, had not committed any crime. Uh, Madame Delphine asked the court to order that the notices prescribed by law be published in the usual place and form in order to enable her to emancipate her slave. And again, this seems like a nice thing to do uh, at first, right? At, le at least nice for the times? Uh, pro possibly and probably not. Uh, this could have, in fact, been a pretty cruel act. Sometimes slave owners would emancipate or free elderly slaves so they just didn't have to provide for them in their senior years, which most plantation slave owners actually did do. Uh, but sometimes when, when, these, when these slaves were unable to keep working for them, they would, quote unquote, free some poor, destitute, crippled senior, leave them, you know, elderly, often disabled, uh, without a penny to their name, to somehow fend for themselves in their last years. Pretty fucked up. Uh, I don't know if this is what Madame Delphine did, but it's worth pointing out. On January 28th, 1828, the now 40-year-old Delphine marries again. Uh, her third and final husband, the man who made her Madame Delphine Lalaurie, was Dr. Leonard Louis Nicholas Lalaurie. Uh, Dr. Louis is said in virtually all the sources to be significantly younger than Delphine, but none of the sources seem to know his actual age. I'm confident he's probably a lot older than 13, though. Uh, how weird, weird would it be if it slipped around and he was 13? Uh, he's described as a nondescript man with a hint of darkness about him. Dr. Lalaurie grew up in France. He was a mediocre medical student actually a dental student, who eventually graduated from dental school in uh, Toulouse. After graduation, uh, Lalaurie prepared to immigrate to Louisiana. And, and at that time, which is so interesting to me, uh, dentists and doctors were interchangeable. Like you could, you could you go to one school to, to, to become just uh, the doctor of all things medical. I believe we learned that in the, uh, the Doc Holiday Suck. He left France on a boat called the Fanny on December 8th, 1824, arrived in New Orleans, February 13th, 1825. One month after his arrival, Dr. Lalaurie sought to establish a medical practice in New Orleans. He then started what uh, some describe as a successful medical practice. Others describe as moderately successful. Uh, at the time, uh, there was virtually zero regulation in medicine. <laughs> and it was, as I said, super common from, uh, med for medical professionals just to skip from field to field, which, uh, which cracks me up. You know, you could be a dentist and a surgeon. It's the same thing. Uh, one document shows that Lalaurie billed a man for making a potion to treat a sick slave. Uh, historical details like this actually have helped fuel the rumors that Lalaurie would later medically experiment in, in horrific ways, uh, you know, on the, the slaves he owned with Madame Lalaurie, you know, that he'd go on to do evil shit like, you know, cut them open or sew their mouth shut. Also fueling uh, the legend that Dr. Lalaurie medically experimented on his uh, slaves is the reality that doctors did that uh, quite often. Here's one of many examples of this, which I feel like is important context for our story today. In 1894, the Journal of the American Medical Association announced that for the first time in American history, a public statue had been erected to the memory of a member of the medical profession. J. Marion Sims, uh, first unveiled in Bryant Park in New York City, that monument bore an inscription celebrating a physician whose brilliant achievements carried the fame of American surgery throughout the civilized world. Uh, Sims had designed the vaginal uh, speculum, developing a treatment for 
vesica vaginal fistula, uh, VVF, and he'd built such a successful medical career promoting VVF repair that he would later be dubbed the father of modern gynecology. I mean, pretty cool, right? Not exactly. This uh, VVF treatment he developed came as the result of a lot of terrible vaginal experiments he performed on African-American slaves. And doctors did that shit all the time. And last year, 2018, New York City's Public Design Commission voted unanimously to remove his statue. All right, so there's that. Okay, now let's lighten it, back, lighten it up a bit. Uh, this, this next detail about Dr. Uh, LaLaurie is ridiculous. Upon arriving in the U.S., uh, Dr. LaLaurie sent a letter to the editor of The Courier uh, announcing the following to establish his medical practice in that city. And keep in mind, it's just for extra comedy, that you know he technically is a dentist. He, he, he writes, I pray you to announce in your next number that a French physician has just arrived in this city who is acquainted with the means lately discovered in France of destroying hunches. The individual submitting to the operations required sees his deformity gradually diminish, and after a treatment longer or shorter, according to the extent of the deformity, the body resumes its natural forms. That discovery has met with the greatest success in France, and everything induces the belief that it will have the same result in this country. Man, early 19th century, when dentists are working on hunchbacks. Whiskey, run, saw. <laughs> I just love it. Open wide, let me get a good look at those chompers. Okay. You know, while you're laying there, why, why don't you let me feel around your hunch a bit? Oh, yeah, you got quite a hunch there. I could, I could, I could take that down right after I pull those teeth. Uh, you know, while I'm at it, why don't I check your circulation? Uh, after that, I could, I could try to make sure you're not pregnant. You know, th 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 I could check your pulse. Uh, I can talk to you about some potions for various uh, ailments of the stomach and such. And then let's get you some new eyeglasses. And, uh, and how about you lay on the couch for a bit and talk about your feelings? Dr. One-Stop Shop, that's what they call me. Whiskey, laudanum, saw, dentist. Oh, God. Hunchback. By the end of 1828, Delphine has her first child with Dr. LaLaurie. Jean-Louis, her sixth child overall, if keeping score. Uh, and then Devin, uh, Delphine sells the family plantation and purchases lots for the construction of a new house on September 12th, 1831. Upon this land, Edmond Saunier de Ye Fossa constructed a magnificent mansion in the French Quarter at 1140 Royal Street. Boom! We've made it. Took us a while, had to go through a lot of, had to wade through a lot of history to get here. But now we're at the current address of the original House of Horse. No other building stood there before its construction. The house that sits today is not the original structure, but obviously built in the same lot. The building as we see today is a much larger version of the original. Uh, and this all brings us to the dark side of Madame LaLaurie. LaLaurie House, LaLaurie Mansion is one of the most famous homes in New Orleans, if not in the entirety of the United States. The original LaLaurie home was a magnificent two-story Creole-style structure with an interior courtyard, like a lot of New Orleans homes have, which are fucking beautiful. If you ever walk around, do a lot of peeking through gates. Not even kidding. In the French Quarter, see all these cool little courtyards inside the blocks. Um, had several balconies to allow air to circulate throughout the house. Uh, they decorated opulently and filled the property with gorgeous furniture and the finest art. Uh, the couple regularly threw lavish parties and were a regular feature in the society pages of the local paper. So while we may know a lot about, we may not know, excuse me, uh, we don't know a lot about her thoughts and desires, we do have historical documentation that she liked to party. Not going to let six kids stop that. Uh, like all public lives, the attention was a double-edged sword. In the case of Delphine and Louis, uh, or Louis, it would swing back to cut their heads off, right? By the end of 1832, just a year after moving in, the marriage had began to sour and the two had all but separated. So maybe it's the location that's haunted. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing weird is written about her until she moves here. By October of 1832, rumors of the LaLaurie strange slave abuse begins to circulate or begin to circulate around New Orleans. Also in the fall of 1832, Delphine and Dr. LaLaurie petitioned the court to free one another of, uh, uh, to free, excuse me, to free another one of their slaves, a kind gesture uh, or more cruelty. Uh, I say gest gesture. I, m I meant to say gesture. Uh, on November 16th, 1832, Delphine petitions for an uh, from, for Jesus, an official separation from Lewis. Uh, the charge was that Louis was beating her. Remember these French ones and Louis comes up. I'm like, Louis? Louis? So if I go back and forth, it's the same dude. Her historians disagree as to whether or not this abuse actually happened. Uh, Delphine assisted that the abuse was ongoing. Here's a sworn statement from her representative in court. On the 26th of October last, in the presence of many witnesses, they said Louis Lalaurie 
went so far as to not only ill-treat her, but was to beat and wound her in the most outrageous and brutish manner. Wherefore, the plaintiff prays your honor to authorize her to sue her, uh, said husband, for a separation from bed and board, and thenceforth to grant her decree that they be separated from bed and board to authorize her to live separately from her said husband. So, you know, probably, probably was beaten. This makes me think that this new guy did beat her. Um, she didn't seem to be one to make, you know, uh, fictional claims. There's no record of her doing this with either one of her first husbands. So that's interesting to me, uh, as I, as I think about what goes on coming up. Um, this of course is not usually brought up in the folklore of the subject. Uh, but yeah, it definitely adds questions to the narrative, right? Um, one question is, uh, uh, or adds questions. One question is, were there, was there any correlation between the freeing of the slave and Delphine's decision to separate from her husband? You know, in some accounts, both these events uh, happened on the same day. Did Delphine try and intervene on this particular slave's behalf? You know, was the uh, doctor the sadist and, and, and Madame Lottery one of, uh, you know, his victims? Was this man beaten, this other slave, so terribly that, uh, you know, Delphine thought that she had to free this person? We may never know. But again, it, it is interesting that there were no rumors of ill treatment between Madame Lottery and her slaves during her first two marriages. No rumors of her ever mistreating slaves prior to Dr. Lottery. And then the rumors start around the same time she takes her husband to court for spousal abuse, right? She frees a slave when she, when she does that. All of this makes me wonder what was really going on. After the official separation, Delphine remained to the Royal Street address. Her, her husband is still comes and goes from this place. Uh, they're separated, but not like entirely apart. You know, as we'll see later, this really infamous fire that happens. Um, he was at the residence when all the shit went down that led to their legend. Um, uh, yeah, so... Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move forward chronologically uh, here uh, a little more in a bit, but we're gonna detour into some voodoo hoodoo context that adds to uh, her legend, and uh, and we're gonna kind of stay in the same few year period for quite some time. So how about we hop on out of today's time suck timeline? Good job, soldier. You made it back barely. All right, now we're going to get to some uh, some gruesome stories, accounts of this story, uh, the, the this this pillar of New Orleans uh, horror lore. To really understand why the accounts of the Delphine murders are so graphic and frankly so strange, we have to understand a few things about voodoo and hoodoo. And, uh, and a good way to get into New Orleans voodoo and hoodoo is to introduce an important historical contemporary of Delphine's, Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen of New Orleans. If you've ever been there, they got all kinds of stuff dedicated to her. Certainly a future Times set candidate, uh, Marie Catherine Laveau, again, known as the voodoo queen of New Orleans, born in New Orleans, September 10th, 1801, just 13 years, I guess 14 years after uh, Madame Delphine. Uh, she was the illegitimate daughter of a free man of color and a Creole mother. Her connection with Delphine, not well documented. Uh, however, it is referenced in some dark New Orleans folklore, which I think uh, has to have added to the dark legend of Madame Delphine. One story stems from New Orleans painter Ricardo uh, Pustagno, locally famous for his pa paintings of Madame Lalaurie and the Devil Baby. Devil Baby cap capitalized. It's not just any random Devil Baby, it's the Devil Baby. He stated in an interview that some New Orleans natives claimed Delphine and Dr. Lalaurie were associated with the actual Devil Baby, the spawn of Satan. This was supposedly a deformed or insane child rumored to be the spawn of a mortal woman and a demon, possibly Satan himself. So, you know, it's probably for sure true. Uh, I did look up some Devil Baby stats, and according to the National Society of Unquestionable Facts based in Washington, D.C., 6.7 Devil Babies are born each and every year in Louisiana alone. 75% of them are pure evil. The other 25% are mostly evil. 100% of them grow up to be circus clowns. So there are some facts I made up. But uh, uh, of course, there's not a, a real Devil Baby. But a lot of people have believed there was. Some people still do. They think Madame Delphine and the, and, and the voodoo queen were really in league with Satan and had something to do with bringing a devil baby into this plane of existence. Legend states that the baby was found or, con or, or conjured somehow by the voodoo queen and then given to Delphine and, and her husband to raise. Uh, some would claim that the devil baby was Delphine's godchild. Weird story detail, right? That the voodoo queen found the devil baby but gave it to Madame Delphine to raise. Why didn't she want it? I'm, I'm guessing devil baby would be a hard, hard kid to raise, right? Go clean your room. Fuck off, bitch. I'm devil. I'll clean your fucking clock when you fall asleep tonight. If you need me, I want to be out, you know, in the back, skinning some cats until I feel like stopping. Uh, 
And a devil baby skin and cats actually actually reminds me uh, that I need to talk real quick about today's final sponsor. One last sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Ed Kemper's Pet Sickles. Ed Kemper, the maker of pet sickles and pet kebabs, cat and dog heads, uh, mostly cat heads, violently cut off and jammed on sticks and then either grilled or frozen for your culinary pleasure. Well, Ed has a new product just in time for summer birthday parties. Cat cake pops. Oh, man. I'm, uh, I'm Ed Kemper, and uh, I, I, want, I want you to listen to me talk for a second about cat cake pops. If you do not listen, there's a real good chance that you're going to get my samples going, and I'll start thinking about mother, and your head will end up on a fucking stick. Ha! Any, anyway, my cat cake pops are cat heads that have been baked into delicious cakes, and then those cat head cakes have been pushed down into sticks that I have carved myself for your dining pleasure. No seasoning, no secret spices, no gimmicks. Just delicious cat heads. Delicious cakes and sticks carved while having thoughts of getting so angry with mother. With each stick, you will get a free extra day to not be on my very long people to kill list. To order, please go to Zapples. I am so fucking filled with rage. Uh, that, of course, is not today's sponsor. Uh, we're, we're done with sponsors. Uh, that, that was just a little nod to my interpretation of Ed Kemper from the January Suck, if you're a new listener. Uh, yeah, yeah, I missed mocking that psych- psychopath. No more of that kind of nonsense today. We got enough horror. We got enough horror with uh, Madame Delphine. Let's get back to New Orleans and voodoo. And I about passed out. That's a tough character to do for a prolonged time. It's easy to write that stuff. But then we start doing the voice. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Excuse this water drink. Off mic like a professional. Okay. The unsubstantiated uh, but certainly interesting rumor of Madame LaLaRue La raising a devil baby she got from Voodoo Queen certainly added to her dark legend. Uh, ties her to the religion of voodoo and the bloody dark magic of hoodoo. If hoodoo and voodoo were actually a big part of Madame Delphine LaLaRue's life and we don't know for sure that they weren't, it would explain some of the very specifically gory, uh, you know, blood ritual looking shit she supposedly did to her slaves. Well, it could have been many years, but more specifically from 1831 to 1834. So what is voodoo and hoodoo? Well, first off, voodoo is a word that will forever remind me of Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley's favorite song uh, by Godsmack. I've had this earworm in my head a lot this week, and now I'm going to infect you. And mostly, though, I'm I'm doing this to infect uh, Reverend Paisley. I'm not the one who's so far away when I feel the snake bite enter my vein, switching to Michael McDonald now, and I don't remember why I came. That really wasn't Michael McDonald. Why would, how would he sing that? I'm not. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's too. It's too hard. It's too hard to combine one really distinct melody with another very distinct voice. I'm not the one who's so far... Ah, fuck it. Thank you for that one, Sully. Guessing you're still playing, uh, paying your bills with that 1999 ditty. You guys ever think about that like I do? Somebody writes a song 25 years ago. Royalty checks pay for their life the rest of their life. Okay. Voodoo is a religion that was brought to the West uh, by slaves originating from Africa, hailing from the West Indies in the late 18th century. It's believed to have started in Haiti in 1724, has deeper roots in the much older African practice of uh, voodoo, Practiced by many different African cultures for very many, for many centuries, excuse me, uh, Vodun, uh, Vodun, uh, has a number of gods, rituals, and practices that can be found in today's voodoo. Through slavery, uh, Vodun uh, traditions spread out to places as distant from each other as Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and North America. When slaves were brought to the States, many were forced to convert to Catholicism by their new slave masters. In order to keep a connection to the religion of their homelands, the slaves had to hide their gods. This is a classic example of religious syncretism, right? The uniting of different religions into one new school of thought and or religion. Uh, The slaves integrated Catholicism into their Vodun beliefs, uh, merging their ancestor gods and rituals with Catholic saints and practices and creating a new hybrid religion. Voodoo was practiced and displayed publicly in New Orleans during Madame LaLaurie's life. So much so that laws were passed to keep it in check due to its increasing popularity. In 1782, Louisiana's then Governor Galvez prohibited the importation of of black people from Martinique, explaining that they, quote, are too much given to voodooism and make the lives of citizens unsafe. This ban was lifted in 1803, but the Christian fear of voodoo remained. 
Plantation owners fleeing the revolution in the West Indies began arriving a few years later, bringing uh, with them considerable numbers of West Indian slaves. When Haitian practitioners of voodoo arrived in New Orleans, it became even more popular, even more public. Uh, voodoo became uh, more popular still after the signing of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. The relationship between blacks and whites was less volatile under American rule than it was previously. At least in New Orleans at that time, uh, voodoo flourished and the sect gained a significant number of converts. Some of the voodoo imagery that we are familiar with is a, is a snake, a sacrifice, right? The drinking of blood. Before I looked into this, I remembered some, some zombie shit too. All right, there's definitely some zombie stuff. Uh, voodoo has all kinds of interesting rituals. As you also might imagine, a bunch of uh, bored Louisiana debutantes took a liking. Uh, some of them to the exotic forms of spirituality and acts that were generally seen as taboo. Some of them became a bit obsessed with them, right? Made for good gossip. Few Louisiana uh, whites publicly practiced voodoo, but many gleefully observed and spied on the proceedings. All right, I can picture that. Just, oh my goodness, Marie. They're cutting the head off a chicken. Oh, how dreadful. And look at that man dancing. How sinful. Oh, that dark man with the chiseled abs and all the muscles in his chest and arms and that high, tight butt. Oh, and that strong jawline. Look at those soulful, penetrating, sinful eyes. Why, it's all just so dreadful. Did it just get a lot more humid in here? Uh, prior to any voodoo activity, a common ritual was the, uh, is to raise the power. Uh, this is when all worshipers present, uh, it raises the power of all the worshipers present for this ritual. For this ritual, imagine a voodoo queen and or king standing on a box containing a snake. They join hands. Uh, you know, the, the people of this ritual, they, they to literally transmit the power of the snake to everyone in, the, in attendance. Sometimes they fasten bells to the outside of the box, would shake it to produce a tinkling sound, bewitching the whole congregation. In the midst of the gathering, there would be a, a boiling cauldron in which were thrown chickens, frogs, cats, snails, maybe, maybe some squirrel balls. We don't fuck, we don't know for sure. We weren't there. Always a snake. All these offerings were brought uh, by various attendants. And this is where we get zombies, the dead brought back to life by the power of dark voodoo rituals. Uh, we'll save an in-depth look into zombies, by the way, for a voodoo base uh, suck down the road. But the zombie part would be played by the by some male dancer or or by the zombie or the the voodoo king, representing the le grand zombie or the great zombie. At this point in the ritual, right, this power of 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 you know uh, life over death. At this point in the ritual, everyone present would would come forth to dance and drink from the snake or the evening supply of toffee, a raw alcoholic beverage, you know, completely possessed by snake power. So I guess they filled the snake up with some kind of shit, or I don't know, maybe they're drinking his blood. The dancers would pair off with lust in their eyes, and the ritual would sometimes end in an actual orgy. Hail Lucifina! You know, this kind of shit, of course, scared a lot of white people. Think about early 19th century Christians hearing about or worse witnessing these type of rituals, right? They undoubtedly thought of them as being satanic. Uh, there was a growing concern amongst whites that such meetings were, uh, you know, being held to to work black magic against them, to plot some kind of revolution. For this reason, the city of New Orleans issued a municipal ordinance in 1817, which forbade the gathering of slaves for dancing or any other purpose except on Sundays. Uh, and then only in places designated by the mayor. Super worried about this shit to the point that laws were being passed. This is the atmosphere Madame LaLaurie is living in. Uh, one of our time suck researchers actually spoke with a practitioner of, uh, of voodoo and a dedicated student of hoodoo. This person wished to remain anonymous, but did promise not to turn any of us into zombies. Uh, they outlined the similarities between uh, uh, voodoo, voodoo, hoodoo, many uh, Celtic, Bavarian, other people's early uh, or other early people's traditions. As we mentioned, hoodoo is the practice of folk magic, while voodoo is the much larger religion. In a way, you could think of voodoo as like Catholicism or Lutheranism or, or being Methodist. And hoodoo is like 30 people who are all related in some way, uh, attending a snake handling service in a backwoods Appalachian trailer park church. Uh, adherents of voodoo do not necessarily practice the much more blood related rituals of hoodoo. An example of hoodoo is the popular voodoo doll. Uh, sounds counterintuitive, but voodoo and hoodoo are often confused with each other. Uh, the voodoo doll is, is considered sympathetic magic, otherwise defined as the use of personal effects to facilitate change in a person's life or circumstances, good or bad. A voodoo doll, which again is really hoodoo, starts out as a small cloth doll sewn by the practitioner in the likeness of the target individual or into the likeness of the target individual. Uh, the, the cloth can be made of any material, however it's preferred. The material come from the clothing of the target. The doll is fixed with a mix of herbs right, or herbs, 
uh, cloth, personal items of the target of like hair, fingernails, picture or drawing, their name and or birthday written on a piece of paper and possibly, possibly a couple of pairs of scroll balls. We don't know for sure. Probably not. It's not written anywhere. Once the doll has been completed, the practitioner will breathe life into the doll and then sew it shut. Right? I'm thinking about the uh, the accusations of mouths sewn shut now. Uh, in the, when they, uh, about the torturing the Lollerie supposedly did. From that point, the doll is like a Chucky on crack, right? It's believed to be a living, breathing effigy of the target. Everything that the hoodoo, hoodooer does to the doll is meant to affect the target, like in that one Scooby-Doo episode uh, with the Globetrotters. Uh, other examples of hoodoo practices are curses like stop your slander. Uh, this ritual uses a cow tongue sliced down the center and filled with peppers, pins, rusty na nails, and sometimes even urine. Man. They say God works in mysterious ways. The, the hoodoo God's mysterious as shit. Uh, all of these items are sewn into the cow tongue and nailed to a fucking tree on the target's prop property as one does to invoke spirit powers. Uh, this curse is thought to cause pain and discomfort in the target whenever they slander the hoodooer. And there's, you know, tons of other spells that are done. The, the, and voodoo and hoodoo, they get even more popular when yellow fever is brought on by mosquitoes and that ravages the Louisiana re region. Uh, while slaves and free blacks get sick, they're able to get better while white Europeans die off. And many attributed this to voodoo and hoodoo, uh, as opposed to African-born people's immunity to the virus. Okay, besides a culture of voodoo and hoodoo, another cultural situation that factors into the Madame Delphine Lalaurie legend was growing pushback against slavery and new laws seeking to protect slaves. Uh, Madame Lalaurie was someone who owned a lot of slaves. Made a lot of money off of slaves. Came from a family who owned a lot of slaves. Hung around people who owned a lot of slaves. And a lot of other people in New Orleans around this time were starting to think, you know what? I don't know about this whole slavery thing. It's, it's, it's almost like when you really think about it, it's super fucked up. Uh, an anti-slavery movement had been alive in America since the very beginning. Even some of the founding fathers, despite being slave owners, you know, went on record against it. Uh, economists and business owners from the North would argue that slavery impeded economic growth. When hiring cheap workers, you know, it would actually be more practical since you didn't have to feed some Irish fella when he was uh, young. You didn't have to take care of him when he was old, as, as again, many Southern slave owners actually did once they retired. Uh, nations like England put their money and their lives of their own soldiers on the line to end slavery throughout their empires and beyond. By the mid to late, late 19th century, for all intent and purpose, uh, slavery was all but eradicated virtually everywhere except the U.S., uh, the, specifically, the, obviously, the South and Brazil. Uh, treatment of slaves and laws dictating the treatment range from state to state. The Louisiana Code Noir or Code of Ethics relating to slaves read as follows. We also forbid all of our subjects in this colony, whatever their conditional rank may be, to apply on their own private authority the rack to their slaves under any pretense whatsoever and to mutilate said slaves in any of their limbs or in any part of their bodies under the penalty of the confiscation of said slaves in and said masters so offending shall be liable to a criminal prosecution. We only permit masters when they think that their case requires it to put their slaves in irons and to have them whipped with rods or ropes. Louisiana Code Noir, 1724. Now, that's way back in 1724. How, how crazy is that? The Louisiana legislators felt the need to pass a law forbidding physically mutilating people, right? You don't pass a law like that in a staunch pro-slavery area, in my opinion, unless a shit ton of mutilation is already going on, which is disturbing. Like if Madame LaLaurie herself did not mutilate slaves, if, uh, if no one in her household mutilated her slaves, other slaves were for sure mutilated in Louisiana, which is, which is his own haunted tour worthy horror story. Okay. Now all the cultural context has been laid out. So, so how did Madame LaLaurie truly become known for being a torturer of slaves? It all started with a fire. On April 10th, 1834, fire broke out in the LaLaurie residence on Royal Street, starting in the kitchen. When the police and fire marshals arrive, they supposedly find the cook, a 70-year-old woman, chained to the stove by her ankle. This cook allegedly later said that she had set the fire as a suicide attempt because she feared being punished. She said that slaves taken uh, to the uppermost room of the house never came back. As reported in the New Orleans Bee, the very next day, April 11th, 1834, bystanders responding to the fire attempted to enter the slave quarters to ensure that everyone had been evacuated. Upon being refused the keys by the Lalleries, uh, the bystanders broke down the doors to the slave quarters and found, quote, seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, 
suspended by the neck with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other, who claimed to have been in prison there for some months. One of those who entered the premises was Judge uh, Jean-Francois uh, Cagnage, who later wrote uh, uh, for the New Orleans Bee, or, or what he said was later printed, excuse me, in the New Orleans Bee. He said, uh, the following deposition stating the material facts attendant upon the horrible disclosures at the late conflagration has been made by Judge Canago before, or Canage, fucking whatever his name is, uh, goddamn French, English, this Judge C, fuck it, it's, it's Judge C. Uh, coming from the source it does is entitled to full credence. We shall make no comments, but let the document speak for itself. The, de the deponent, uh, uh, declares that on Thursday, ten some of these things are hard too because it's written in English, but like with an asterisk. They have so many archaic words. It's fucking people. Why can't they always just speak the same language as me, which is not good English. Anyway, uh, on Thursday, the 10th, a fire took place on the premises of Ms. or Mrs. Lalaurie, uh, that this is just poorly written, that he repaired as a citizen for the purpose of affording any assistance within his power, uh, that on arriving, there he was apprised of there being one of the apartments some slaves who were chained and who were, from their situation, exposed to perish in the congregation. And he, and he said a bunch of uh, other stuff uh, in this letter that basically um, he gets this thing of, uh, he, he claims that he talked to the Lollaries, and I'm just kind of summarizing now. I was, I was originally planning on reading this all, but it's just, it's written so bad. Um, he was planning on, you know, trying to help people who were trapped inside, uh, ask the Lollaries, to give them, you know, to let to let these people in, let him and some other people in to help the others trapped inside and says that the Lollaries were just like, nah, nah, we don't, don't worry about it. Uh, and, and basically just refused to help them. Um, and so they had to break open the doors. I'll go back and do it for a second there. And, he, and then he says, accompanied by the citizens with him, uh, he entered and, and found two negresses with, uh, incarcerated whom he had liberated from this den. Several voices were heard that were other victims in the kitchen. He repaired thither, but found no one. That one of the negresses had an iron collar, very large and very heavy, and was chained with heavy irons by the feet. That she walked with the greatest difficulty that he was unable to examine the one behind. That one individual, whom he believes to be Mr. Guillette, said to him he knew of another slave was confined. He entered with this gentleman into another apartment, where, upon someone's removing a mosquito bar, uh, an old negress was found with a deep wound in her head. She appeared to be quite feeble, too much so to be able to walk. Uh, then the deponent uh, desired some of the persons present to have her removed to the mayor's office, where the first two had been removed. Uh, they demanded uh, Mr. Lalaurie if he had any slaves in his garrets. Uh, so basically, I guess they're trying to ask him, like, hey, man, do you have any more people that need to be helped? He replied in an insulting tone that they were persons who would do better by remaining at home than visiting others to dictate to them laws in the quality of officious friends. Okay. So here's what I just got from that. No one saw uh, buckets of body parts littered, littering the room or a woman with her skin peeled into a spiral, you know, uh, so she resembled some kind of caterpillar like a New Orleans ghost uh, tour guide will tell you. But uh, it seems that several people uh, who were witnesses to the fire did find other human beings, you know, slaves shackled inside in irons. Uh, you know, it does appear that a lot of Rees didn't seem interested in saving them that they seemed very okay with letting them be burned alive and that, uh, you know, these people inside were very, very, very mistreated. And in another article from the time, there are reports of people witnessing the bodies of, quote, mutilated slaves. That doesn't look good. All right, I think there is, uh, there's starting to be more truth to this legend than I originally thought there was going to be. Following that 1834 fire, the New Orleans Bee also reported that an angry mob formed around the Delphine home once the fire was put out and that a sheriff and his officers, like once people started hearing about the uh, atrocities that supposedly went on in there, uh, uh, and then a sheriff and his officers were called in to disperse the crowd. And then the paper reported that by the time the mob left, the Royal Street property had sustained major damage with, quote, scarcely anything remaining but the walls. The paper also reported that slaves who survived the fire were taken to a local jail where they were made available for public viewing. The New Orleans Bee reported that by April 12th, up to 4,000 people had attended to view the slaves to convince themselves of their sufferings. That doesn't look good. Uh, I mean, still, it's not reports of crude sex changes and crap people, but still a lot of horrible shit. So, but, but how did that story grow into the story of today? Well, an early British social theorist named Harriet uh, Martineau has a lot to do with that. Harriet is widely considered the world's first female sociologist. She was a contemporary of Lollaries who traveled to New Orleans two years after the rumors of slave torture, two years after the fire in 1836 to interview locals. 
In her findings, she did note that Madame Delphine's slaves looked haggard and wretched in appearance. That's what people told her. Uh, Harriet reported that one of LaLaurie's neighbors once saw uh, one of the LaLaurie slaves, a 12-year-old girl named Leah, fall to her death from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion while trying to avoid punishment from a whip-wielding Delphine LaLaurie. This is an important piece of the puzzle that speaks to her, you know, direct involvement in, in slave abuse. There are several different versions of the Leah story. Here's the main one. Leah was combing Madame LaLaurie's hair in 1834. Madame LaLaurie, roughly 47 years old at this time, apparently at some point she tugs the Madame's hair too hard. Delphine goes fucking berserker, right? Uh, grabs a nearby bullwhip and chases after this young girl whose exact age is not given in the accounts that I read. Accounts vary widely what, uh, regarding what happened next. There were allegedly witnesses to this, but their stories about this event do vary a bit. Some accounts say Leah was first beaten with the whip uh, and then kind of thrown off the roof. Uh, most accounts, however, say she ran to the side of Madame Delphine grabbing a bullwhip. All accounts do have her running from Madame Delphine and ultimately falling or being pushed to her death from either the roof of the home or from an upstairs window. So did she jump? You know, from from the home, from the uh, roof of the home to escape. Did she did she trip? Was she pushed? These are some of the questions around these events that will likely never be completely answered. Uh, but there are records that show that uh, you know Madame uh, Delphine Larry was fined for her involvement in the death of this girl. Fined a measly three hundred dollars, but still, you know, there's a record of this happening, and and of her being guilty of this happening. Some kind of abuse, according to Harriet uh, Martineau. This incident led to an investigation of the Larrys. Uh, in which they were found guilty of illegal cruelty to other slaves and then forced they were forced to forfeit nine additional slaves. Sadly, these nine slaves were brought uh, were bought back uh, you know uh, by the Lollaries through and through a, through a relative. They had a relative go buy them back and then give them to the uh, Madame Delphine and her husband and then they were returned to the Royal Street residence. you know, sadly shit like that happened all the time. Interesting to note uh, that the Lollaries got in legal trouble for slave mistreatment during an era of history when it was the norm to mistreat slaves, which leads me to believe that at the very least, uh, you know, these people were especially sadistic and cruel. Uh, Martineau also recounted stories that the uh, Lollerie kept her cook chained to the kitchen stove, that she beat her daughters when they attempted to feed slaves. Uh, the Pitts, uh, Pittsfield son, writing several weeks after the evacuation of Lollerie's slave quarters following the fire, claimed that two of the slaves found in the Lollerie mansion had died since the rescue, and then added, we understand that in digging in the yard, bodies have been disinterred and that the condemned well in the grounds of the mansion, having been uncovered, others, particularly that of a child, were found. So, you know, more bodies are found uh, secretly buried on the property. Uh, ten years later, another author will darken the already dark tale of Madame LaLaurie, the American novelist George Washington Cable, probably the most famous writer to spread the LaLaurie legend. He was born in Louisiana in 1844. He fought for the Confederate Army, later became a journalist and his stories of Creole life before and after the Civil War painted an incredible picture of pride, opulence, racism, and money. His eye for detailing the battle between the Americans and French Creole was remarkable, especially in his famed novel, uh, The Grande Cimes. Uh, he conveyed a sense of disapproval toward the racism still present in Louisiana after the Civil War. Cable eventually moved to Massachusetts, became friends with Mark Twain, and they actually did some uh, book lecture tours together. And in, and in his book, Strange True Stories of Louisiana, originally published in 1889, he told the lottery tale. He didn't include medical experiment injuries uh, in the list of tortures uh, suffered by the slaves, but he did corroborate claims of household slaves being terribly mistreated and then being freed, you know, by others during and after this terrible fire. And his accounts are backed up with original documents and depositions given after the incident in 1834. And then decades later, in 1946, Jean de Levine uh, wrote Ghost Stories of Old New Orleans, this is the book most likely responsible for some of the gorier embellishments on what the rescuers found during the Lollary House Fire of 1834, uh, including stories of medical experiments and buckets of body parts. No documentation to back up aspects, uh, these aspects of the story. Uh, De Levine wrote a horror story, not a historical book, but his book has been treated as a historical account since. Um, I'm sorry, Jeannie, not Jean. So it's a she, Jeannie De Levine. Uh, she wrote, for example, the man who smashed the garret door saw a powerful male slave, stark naked, chained to the wall, their eyes gouged out, their fingernails pulled out by the roots, 
Others had their joints skinned and festering, great holes in their buttocks where the flesh had been sliced away, their ears hanging by shreds, their lips sewn together, their tongues drawn out and sewn to their chins. Severed hands stitched to bellies, legs pulled joint from joint. Female slaves there were, their mouths and ears crammed with ashes and chicken offal and bound tightly. Others had been smeared with honey and were a mass of black ants. Intestines were pulled out and knotted around naked waists. There were holes in skulls where a rough stick had been inserted, inserted to stir the brains. Some of the poor creatures were dead, some were unconscious, and a few were still breathing, suffering agonies beyond any power to describe. And again, that's a horror novel where they really amped it up and clearly integrated a bunch of voodoo hoodoo stuff. And then, you know, since it's kind of become part of the, you know, quote unquote, factual mythology. And then in 1998, the story's taken even further, uh, embellished further by a book called Journey into Darkness, Ghosts and Vampires of New Orleans by Kalila Katrina, uh, Katharina Smith, who is the operator of a New Orleans ghost tour business. Smith's book added more explicit details. Uh, such as, you know, a, a victim who obviously had her arms amputated and her skin peeled off in a circular pattern, making her look like a human caterpillar, and another who had her limbs broken and reset at odd angles so she resembled a human crab. Uh, other specific tales of atrocities not documented by early eyewitnesses uh, have also wove their way into Delphine's story. Stories of people chained to walls and strapped to tables, their limbs stretched and torn. People were suspended by their necks, which were also stretched and torn. You know, uh, and, and, you know, and those, some of those actually were in some of those early newspaper accounts. Uh, you know, women wearing uh, cruel spiked iron collar collars. Uh, one story is that a woman allegedly had her mouth forced open, feces of some kind shoved in, and then her lips sewn shut. Again, fucking hoodoo. Uh, and then there's, yeah, there's that whole story that uh, gets told by a lot of the tour guides about the guy um, with, the, with the spoon sticking out of his head. You know, he had the hole drilled and the spoon sticking out that it, it was meant to, quote, stir his mind. Or, you know, drive him stir crazy. Another potential hoodoo legend. Uh, there are tales of a female uh, slave bound, uh, found hung to the rafters by her wrists and her intestines wrapped around her body, um, which was um, supposedly thought to be some hoodoo practice, some ritual. And other accounts say that after the fire, workers found a number of bones buried on the floorboards and in the yard, uh, or in addition to, you know, on, in the yard. All right, so that's, that's, those are all the legends. So what about the Lala Rees? What happened to them? Well, Harriet Martineau, that sociologist, wrote in 1838 that uh, Madame Delphine fled New Orleans during the mob violence that followed the fire, taking a coach to the waterfront, then traveling by schooner to Mobile, Alabama, and then traveling on from there to Paris. Looks like she fled alone. Her and the doctor do not seem to have stayed together at all following the fire. Uh, you know, Dr. LaLaurie sort of just disappears around 1842. Um, that year, he sent a letter that had been seen or that we found, uh, he sent this letter from Cuba to a friend in New Orleans, basically asking if they could send him some of his shit after the, you know, separation and everything, stuff that was still in New Orleans. Um, Madame Delphine Martineau wrote that she had her six-year-old son by Louis Lalaurie, Jean-Louis with her. She also had her three of her adult children. And according to Harriet and other accounts, once Delphine made it to France, she just kind of kept living her life and uh, as if she had not done something horrific. She could not be prosecuted in France for what she had allegedly done in New Orleans. Contrary to a lot of other accounts, uh, she didn't have to live in secret. Uh, Jeannie, Delphine's daughter by Jean Blanc, allegedly visited her mom in Paris in the late 1830s with her children and husband, as shown by numerous pieces of correspondence found in the Missouri History Archives. Uh, Madame Lalaurie supposedly thrived in Paris. She conducted business in France, paid taxes, even supposedly financed the repair of a residence she still had in New Orleans. Um, not the Royal Street one, but a different one that she rented out. There are several accounts of Delphine's death that have been entertained by storytellers and historians. One report suggests that she was killed by a wild boar in a hunting accident in France, while another more likely uh, story ran in the New Orleans paper, The Times, Picayune, in March 1892, said that she died amongst friends and family in Paris. You know, as a, uh, a quite old, uh, apparently, you know, if, if, uh, if she died in 1892, she'd been over 100 years old. She might have made it back to New Orleans before she died. In the late 1930s, Eugene Bax, who served as sexton to St. Louis, uh, St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 until 1924, discovered an old cracked copper plate in the Alley 4 Cemetery, or Alley 4, excuse me, of that cemetery. The inscription on the plate read, or reads, Madame Lalaurie, born, Madame, born Marie Delphine McCarty, died in Paris December 7th, 1842. 
at the age of 60 something. Um, that final number was apparently uh, missing or eroded. But, you know, if she died in 1842, then she would have been, uh, well, she wouldn't have been quite 60. She would have been like uh, 57. All the numbers are a little, little fishy, but, th but these are all, uh, all the things that are said. Where is she buried? We don't know. Uh, Jean Blanc, the Blanc daughters, and Madame Lalaurie all rest in unknown burial sites. Um, but there's lots of speculation. There's a uh, speculation that she's in one of those, you know, uh, New Orleans cemetery. Uh, there's a couple thrown around as, you know, possibly one of the, uh, number, the number two crypt in the four stall plots, one of the four stall plots in the St. Louis cemetery. Uh, what about the house, uh, where the slaves were probably tortured? Well, after, uh, Lalaurie's death, it was, it was purchased. And at some point prior to 1888, it was restored. Over the following decades, it was used as a public high school, a conservatory of music, an apartment building, a refuge for young delinquents, a bar, that's just what, how it's written, a furniture store, a luxury apartment building, and then as I said earlier, Nicolas Cage bought it in uh, 2007. And then uh, the current owner is, uh, you know, someone with the Regions Financial Corporation is, is uh, the last record that I have found. Okay. Sorry that this one was a little bit all over the place. I actually you know, spent more time on this one than, than a lot of recent ones. Man, when you look into this tale, it is super, super hard uh, to decipher folklore from actual facts. You know, the court records themselves are hard to read because those people spoke in a fucking weird, formal, crazy-ass Creole version of English. Um, but here's my final thoughts. You know, there may not have been any bodies in the attic. You know, but they did supposedly dig up skeletons from the yard. Uh, there is evidence of a lot of mistreatment for sure, including the controversial death of 12 year old Leah. Was the abuse worse than what other slave owners were probably committing at the time? I think it was, I think it was probably quite a bit worse. Uh, even, even here internally in the suck dungeon, there's some disagreement on this, but I think, I think uh, a lot of the legend actually is true. I think it's going to be impossible to determine if the abuse came at the hands of either Dr. Lollery or Madame Delphine Lollery, but based on the Leah tale and the, the fine she was given, it does seem that Madame Delphine might have become quite cruel in her later years. I mean, there's also, you know, this, I mean, you know, the, the, the possibility that a lot of that was under the influence of Dr. Lottery, because again, none of this stuff happened, at least documented wise, until he came into the picture. I don't know, maybe it was his influence. Maybe she was covering for him most of the time. Uh, there's eyewitness accounts of her, you know, not caring that slaves were trapped in a burning structure. You know, uh, many witnessed her slaves in a poor physical state. And, and again, how much of that was her and how much of it was her husband? I, I do think that he was probably a much bigger monster than she was. Um, you know, could some of this have been false testimony? Yes, we'll never know. But we do know that they both were run out of town because of tales of mistreatment. You know, tales that started being printed the day after the fire, not necessarily years later. People got so mad about her treatment of slaves that an angry mob attacked her property, you know, two decades before the Civil War. I don't think that happens unless you've gone fucking way outside the bounds of what was acceptable at the time. And a certain level of abuse of slaves was acceptable at that time. So to receive the press she did, to flee town like she did, to flee the whole country as her and her estranged husband who ended up in Cuba did, that leads me to believe that, you know, the two of them, or at least one of them, were terrible, terrible, terrible people. Um, do I think she raised a devil baby and broke people's bones to reshape them into crap people? Fuck no. But I do think she may have uh, done shit that was equally horrific. I mean, as we learned, doctors really did do horrific medical experiments on slaves. You know, uh, and the rumors of abuse didn't begin until after she married a doctor. That's a weird, you know, coincidence if it's not outright incriminating. I think there's a good chance there was some weird experiments done on those poor people. But without more details, I mean, this is just my speculation and opinion. We'll never know the full story, which is why her former home is such a popular spot for a ghost tour. Right. There's allusions to all kinds of horrible, dark shit. There's the voodoo, hoodoo angles. I mean, it makes for a great ghost tour tale, you know, because there will f forever be the possibility that, that some mad woman of New Orleans really did do horrific shit deserving of a later depiction as, as that monster Kathy Bates, you know, portrayed in the third season of American Horror Story. It's a crazy tale for sure, with or without the voodoo or hoodoo elements. Let's take a. Uh, Take a few more looks back at this tale in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the tale of Madame Delphine is a fascinating mix of fact and folklore. Did she mistreat slaves and possibly even torture them? I'm going to say she probably did. Uh, did she turn them into human caterpillars and crab people and raise a devil baby? No, uh, probably not. 
Uh, number two, did Madame Delphine or her third husband perform horrible medical experiments on slaves? Possibly. Me personally, I think probably. I have no hard evidence of that, but we do know that doctors really did perform these experiments. Uh, number three, Jean-Pierre Blanc, Delphine's second husband, was a fucking pirate. Pretty cool. Or at least a dude who ran with pirates. He was also a lawyer whose association with pirates helped save America in the War of 1812. Fun side detail. Number four, sadly, the most important witnesses to this whole story were never likely interviewed. Not that we know of. Uh, the slaves that lived in the Lollary house. Due to racism, no one ever seemed to ask them what they thought about this. Certainly a missed opportunity to know a lot more about this story. Number five, new info. If you want to go on the tour, I went on the sparked my interest in this topic. Check out Ghost City Tours in New Orleans. They're not a sponsor. It's just a business that I, you know, I went. I, I thought it was cool. Uh, they'll walk you around the French Quarter, talk at length about the legends of Madame Delphine, voodoo queen, uh, you know, Marie uh, Laveau, Haitian zombies, tons of hauntings. Uh, I recommend it highly if you like getting the chills. Dark folklore is highly morbidly entertaining. Hail Lucifina. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The episode has been sucked, right? New Orleans sucked again. I already look forward to getting back there for the next suck. What an interesting city. Interesting tale. Fascinating mix of history, true crime, and folklore. Uh, I hope you liked it as much as we did here in the Suck Dungeon. I hope it wasn't too convoluted. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Axis Apparel. Thanks to New Orleans native and upcoming summer intern here in the Suck Dungeon, so Sophie Fact Sorceress Evans. I uh, hope Sophie enjoyed what I did with the beginnings of her research. And huge thanks again to new full-time Suck Dungeon employee and head of research, Zach still needs a nickname Flannery for all of his massive help. Uh, if you haven't already done so, check out the Cult of the Curious private face, uh, Facebook group online. Over 8,000 members now. Over 2,000 members on Discord. You can link to both in the episode description. Also link to Discord in the Time Suck app. Next week's Time Suck, we're going back to Russia. Back to the USSR! We did that a lot here, man. We love talking about Russia. Talking about the KGB this time. What's this big deal with Russia fascination? Uh, the space lizards have spoken. The topic of the KGB won the last space lizard vote. The tale of the KGB leads us all over the place. From intense spying and espionage to the ingenious technologies of the Cold War and uh, uh, all those atrocities that were committed in the name of national security. Imagine the worst serial killer in history and then rinse and repeat that several million times to understand what the KGB did. Chikatilo, Mikhail Popkov, Alexander Pashushkin, Ah, they don't have shit on the KGB. KGB was a multifaceted, uh, multifaceted organization that combined intelligence gathering, national defense duties, protection of Soviet officials, uh, messing with other nations' election processes. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Uh, they were also entrusted with policing their own people. Big mistake. The treatment of political dissidents and undesirables in the gulags is one of the most horrific and mind-fucking bits of world history. Uh, the details not for those with weak stomachs. But if you handle it today... You can probably handle that. Uh, thanks to a couple of Russia's, uh, thanks to a couple of Russia's best writers, we'll go into details of life in the gulags. We'll also look into the many friendly competitions that the U.S. and the USSR had going between each other. We'll cover the space race last week, right? There was propaganda wars that were equally interesting. Uh, also, this topic gives us an excuse to look into the many secret police agencies around the world. How does the KGB compare to the Israeli uh, Mossad or Britain's? Uh, what is it? Uh, M M M I six. I always want to say M16, but it's MI6. Uh, there, there's such a vast topic with the KGB, filled with traitors, national heroes, six uh, secret military actions, perhaps the most amped up fear-based propaganda in history. And at the end of next week's episode, I hope that we can all get a better understanding of just how far collectivism and ideology can go. Uh, when neighbors police neighbors in the name of the common good, it seems, at least in this, in this case, uh, that nothing good comes from it. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's now mosey on over into the not-secret-at-all world of Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Got a few of you with my dog lies in the moon landing episode. Time sucker Dylan Melvano is one of you who got pretty sad for those dogs for a bit. Uh, Dylan wrote, God damn it. You got me after 135 podcasts. You got me one dog in space. Yeah, I knew that four dogs. Sure. Why not? But 26 fucking chihuahuas, and I didn't even think for a second that you might be full of shit. 
I'm sitting here thinking about how they could even survive the force of the launch. Not even thinking about why they would cram so many damn chihuahuas into one shuttle. Damn you, Dan Cummins. <laughs> Uh, sorry, not sorry, Dylan. I love that you were left wondering, like, why in God's name is NASA cramped? Why 26? Why couldn't they just put like one or two big dogs? Like, what does that even prove? Uh, next update is to let you Des Moines area suckers know some good is being done in your neighborhood just over a week. Uh, Chris Tamares, uh, wrote in saying, uh, uh, hello, I'm a loyal listener of Time Suck and a newly born space lizard. My wife, Elizabeth, and I just saw your show in Des Moines. My wife is 29 and has uh, psoriatic. I didn't prepare for this word. Psoriatic, I believe. Arthritis, which acts a lot like rheumatoid arthritis. She was diagnosed five years ago uh, when getting a standard checkup after she hit her knee on something and the swelling didn't go down for two weeks. We've done this walk two years in a row and this will be our third year. Last year, I helped raise money by setting the goal of $500 and then I would cut my hair. Uh, At the time, I had been growing my hair out for four years. I had a pretty big fro, but it was for a good cause. When we saw you last year, I just cut my hair into a double mohawk. Uh, This year, we're trying to raise $700 for her team, the Flare Bears. It would mean a lot to me if you could mention this on an upcoming podcast. I copied the link here just in case. Uh, Thank you for everything you guys do with this podcast. Remember to keep on sucking loyal space lizard Chris uh, Tamaris. Well, Chris, uh, yeah, thank you for for sending that info in and um, adding that link to today's episode description. Thanks for that Des Moines show. It's so much fun, by the way. Uh, Good on you. For getting out there and doing some good in the world. Hell, Nimrod. Hope some Des Moines area suckers show up at that walk. Because we, we saw quite a few that night. A lot of, lot of, lot of suckers in Des Moines. Uh, interesting moon landing Nazi update. Now coming in from time sucker Adam uh, Joranstad. Uh, who writes, Dear Suck Master Supreme. I'm currently listening to episode 136, Moon Landing Conspiracy. I had to stop to send you a correction. When you mentioned the conspiracy that there are Nazis on the moon, you said it's not logical because they couldn't build an atomic bomb to win World War II, but could build a spaceship. First, I agree with your logic and understand what you were trying to say, but as a World War II history nut, I have to inform you on the nuclear capabilities of the Nazis. You are correct that they never made a nuclear bomb. However, that is not because they couldn't or didn't try to. The Nazis occupied heavy water or deuterium oxide plants in Norway during World War II or maybe it's deuterium. Uh, The Nazis were reportedly close to creating nuclear weapons using the heavy water, but in 1943, Operation Gunnerside, led by Norwegian commandos, was successful in destroying the heavy water production facility. Ah, good for you, Norwegians. You did a very good job. You're very helpful for the world. We're thanking you very much. Ah, Hopefully someday that'll get old to me. Um, This was followed by Allied bombing. The Nazis tried to bring the remaining heavy water back to Germany, but the Norwegian resistance sabotaged the ferry boat in Lake uh, Tin. Um, uh, Joachim Roenberg is the man who led those resistance fighters and is also a suck topic. I added him to the voting a while back, so everyone should vote it up. There's also a great movie called The Heavy Water War that was on Netflix about this topic. Sorry for being long-winded with this correction, but I love teaching people about World War II and I love my Norwegian heritage. Thank you for everything you do here at Time Suck. My wife and I had a blast in Cleveland for the live suck and your stand-up. My wife was the one who got up on stage and wore, and wore Lindsay's crown. You guys couldn't have made her happier. Your loyal spacers, Adam. Uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> I was saying Jordanstad. It's uh, Jordanstad. Uh, thanks for putting that pronunciation there. Oh, man, it was at the bottom. So I said it so wrong so many times. Yeah, thanks thanks for that information. That's very cool. I didn't know about the Norwegians' involvement in that way in the war. Yeah, Jornstead, but it's ah, the double A. Oh, love you. Love you, Scandinavians. You're crazy words. Uh, another lie update coming in from Ryan uh, Lucio. Ryan writes, you assholes. Fucking hoverboard lies. First one to get me. It's all caps. Took 130 odd sucks, but you finally got me good. Well played, sir. You're getting good, Dr. Genius. And not sure if you said it or not, but WD-40 was discovered because of the space race. I don't think I did say that one. Uh, Sorry, Ryan, uh, but I have kind of good news. Now, actually, another sucker, Thomas Fogg, pointed out that a hoverboard does exist. It just exists in a not very usable, but technically real form. Thomas wrote, exciting news, suck master supreme. Believe it or not, real and legitimate hoverboards exist today for real. Check out the Lexus hoverboard. It's powered by liquid nitrogen, cooling the strong magnets inside, causing an effect called quantum locking. There are some easy to view and understand YouTube videos out there explaining the effect and showing it in practice. You can only use these in special skating parks that have metallic bases, but they work and they're really cool. You also don't lose momentum the same way you do with friction from wheels, Thomas Fogg. 
I did watch some videos, Thomas, and it is pretty cool. Uh, I didn't know my lie was kind of true. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool, but it's still not what I want. It's still not Marty McFly back to the future. Cool, right? It's, it's sweet, but it's not hanging on behind a car suite. So hopefully soon. Uh, another moon landing update from time sucker Marshall. Uh, I won't give his last name because Marshall, not happy, not happy with the episode. Marshall wrote, dude, the moon landing episode was especially acidic and mean hearted, disappointing and hard to listen to. Usually enjoy your respectful and well-researched take on history and conspiracies, but this was not your best effort. Take care. All right. All right, Marshall. I hear, I hear you. Uh, but you know what? Some weeks I just can't respect aggressive ignorance. And to me, that's what the moon landing conspiracy represents. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that suck. I, no, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very happy with that suck. Uh, to me, the moon landing conspiracy, you know, when you just, when you actually look into it is not mo any more credible than the flat earth theory. And frankly, it's just as disrespectful to the world's scientific community. When you say you don't believe it happened, you're not just saying, I respectfully disagree. You have your opinions and uh, I have mine and we should both respect each other. Because your, your opinion is not respectful if you believe that. You know, because you're essentially saying that everyone who works for NASA, everyone who's been working for NASA, everyone who died in the NASA, you know, like space program disasters is a dirty fucking liar. And a thief. And a dirty thief for taking money for shit that doesn't even happen. For a bunch, being a bunch of bullshit. That, to me, that belief system is inherently disrespectful. Uh, I, I do believe, Marshall, that tolerance can be taken too far. And I am proudly, extremely intolerant towards aggressive ignorance. Uh, an emotional reaction to last week's update sent in from space lizard James Pitt, who wrote, I felt that in the moon landing updates today, dude, a total chain reaction from thousands of space lizards getting choked up at the same time. Last month and a half has been crazy at work, and every time I got a thought, I was sending it your way because this show has helped me get through some dark as fuck nights at work. Then I hear you reading that email and I realize I'm doing just fine and a temporary bad time doesn't compare to what other people deal with 24 fucking seven. Thanks to you and your crew for creating the best community ever. My heart goes out to all of you space lizards. Oh man, that is so sweet, James, man. Thank you so much, man. Sorry you're having some rough times and, uh, and, and glad in a way, you know, that that message could, could help. Uh, more appreciation for the Time Suck community coming in from Time Sucker Paul Werda, who writes, I think I'm sending this to where I'm supposed to, but I'm not sure. So sorry in advance if I'm not, LOL. Well, you know what? No LOL needed because you fucking nailed it. Hashtag nailed it. Uh, I've been wanting to write in for a while. And by the way, you send these things into bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com if you don't want to use the, uh, the message uh, feature on the app or website. That's the email address where we get all these. Uh, I've been wanting to write in for a while. And after listening to your moon landing suck and the time sucker update of the week, I figured I should finally do it. If I remember correctly, I found your podcast after you were a guest on someone else's podcast and followed over to yours. In all realness, I was not all that into your comedy. <laughs> I like I like it. I like the realness. However, I definitely see why others are. That I love the way you phrase it. And if we all like the same things, the world would be a boring place. <laughs> that said, I'm definitely starting to find myself laughing more often than not. I kept listening initially because I was fascinated by the topics and the information you covered and enjoyed the formatting of your podcast. As time goes on, I find myself uh, more and more getting into the podcast because of the community you've built as a result of it. Many entertainers and content creators can make a difference by providing entertainment or knowledge, but unlike others, you're doing so much more. You and your community are genuinely changing people's lives and bringing people of all walks of life together. You may not necessarily believe in God, but you're, all, but you're definitely doing God's work. The end of your podcasts are always filled with stories of the good that comes from what you've created, and there's countless more lives you've touched that you don't even know about yet. You're a beautiful soul and genuinely positive influence on the world, and it's a better place because of you. The earth may be filled with an incredible diversity of people, but we all look up at the same moon. Exactly. Or in this case, listen to the same podcast. Sorry for the long message. You got me in the feels. Thanks for all you've done and for doing what you do and praise Bojangles, Paul. Well, thank you. That was very, very, very kind, Paul. I appreciate it. I hope I'm doing God's work. You know, I don't know who God is. I'm not religious in that sense. But I do, most days, believe in God. Uh, I believe in an undefined, unknowable God, but a God the same, you know? When I hail Nimrod, I, I feel like I am hailing some creative, mysterious force that I don't even need to fully understand. That's why I have on my arm, uh, embrace the darkness tattoo. That's how important that concept is to me. Just embrace the unknown. Don't worry about it. You don't have to figure it out. Uh, thank you. Uh, one final message of well, -wisher, uh, well wishes to go out on. Uh, this comes from Texas sucker Kagan Mercer, who writes, Hey, Master Sucker, my name is Kagan coming to you from Central Texas. And I didn't know where else uh, to do this, so I'm gonna ask a favor of you. Pass this message to Adam and Jake from the time sucker uh, updates, uh, the little warrior fighting cancer. 
doing that right now. I'm sure you have said before which uh, where to type. I just don't remember, but I pride myself on my ability to control my emotions, especially since I'm a firefighter EMT and I have to deal with emotional situations every shift. But damn it, Adam got me. Coming back from my paramedic class, I had tears coming out of my eyes. I'm a pediatric cancer survivor myself from 1996, 1998. I had leukemia and even went as far as getting the Make-A-Wish Foundation trip, which as I'm sure you know, is for kids who are supposed to die. But thanks to my incredible doctors and hospital, and for me, thanks to the help of God, I am here today and I just want to pass along to Adam and Jake that hang in there, trust your doctors, trust your religion if you have any. He has an army behind him and we are all pulling uh, for him. I just wanted to reach out and tell him that it's possible to beat cancer at a young age. I'm living proof. I'm 25, have been in remission for coming up on 21 years. Just keep fighting. Don't let it get him or you down. Keep pushing forward. Don't give up and live, little man. Live a hell of a life and fuck cancer. Anyways, that's all I wanted to say. Sorry if there are any typos in this. I'm typing in a hurry, but thanks for all you do, Master Sucker. And also a few episodes back, you donated to the Firefighters Foundation. And man, that is a badass thank you. Uh, or man, that is badass. Thank you for that. I love hearing that. I love hearing the sucks. Keep it coming. Keep on sucking. And hail Nimrod. Hail Nimrod to you, Kagan. And hail Nimrod to all you uh, good doers out there. All you who uh, who root for people uh, to get better. All you uh, who uh, can uh, you know set aside different political and religious ideologies and and, and love each other just the same. Uh, yeah, I think I think we do have a pretty good thing here at Time Suck where. You know, <laughs> I try to limit my anger and hatefulness uh, to people who are, are trying to just fucking ruin good shit in the world, you know, to those staunchly opposed to science, uh, to despots and just murderers and terrible people and pedophiles who act on their pedophilic urges and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but everybody else, I like, I like how we're bonding together and trying to help each other out here. I appreciate you sending that message to, uh, yeah, man, to, to Adam and Jake. That's very, very kind of you. And that's all for today's Time Sucker Updates. You guys are the fucking best. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, suckers. I'll be speaking with some of you spacers on Thursday, between now and then. Uh, and really kind of always, don't chase kids with whips. Uh, don't adopt devil babies. And, you know, don't, don't turn people into crap people. Focus instead on just, just continuing to do your best to keep on sucking. Oh. Fucking Ed Kemper voice. I felt like I about tore something in my throat. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take some special tea to drink if Ed Kemper's coming up in an episode. I don't even want to say mother. It's a little bit painful now. Mother, why is it hurting my throat so bad? Mother, could you give me a cough drop before I put your fucking head on a stick and fuck your neck? <laughs>